Are we live? Are we live? We are going live. All right, cool. All right, so I'm live. I'm back from outer space. I just walked in here to find you with that sad look of fun. I'm an idiot. I am such an idiot. How's everybody doing this morning? Happy 4th of July to all my American peoples. Um, I know some of you guys are on holiday today. I know myself. I'm not that lucky. I don't get the day off as far as my own job goes. Uh, tonight I'm going to have to go in. So it's going to be... Uh, yeah, I slept in a little bit. I'll be fine. Let's see who's all here. All right. So I saw something on the way in. Josh, Josh Tompkins, you're watching this uh, using in-flight Wi-Fi on your way home from Italy? Vacation or business, bud? Uh, let's see. Uh, Firecrack's not able to stay. That sucks. Richard Johnston's, hold on to your everything. Ronnie says, for the Emperor of City of Black says, how's everybody doing today? I'm doing fine. Uh, let's see here. Buddy Burroughs is here. Aquila's here. Jeremy Berry's here. Sir Skitari Bush is here. He says, Oi, mates! And um, Master Mistakes, the Master of Context, is here. Our Nukes is here. The Death Corps Trooper is back and ready for business. Yumbring is here. Let's see, Zach. Zach says, You're in space. Hey, McQuilla, what's going on, bud? Happy 4th, Mike. Um, let's see. A City of Black says, I'll probably crash after the stream. I will be crashing after the streams. Streams. Warden says, good morning. Bloody Magpie says, Brother Klepto reporting for duty. Who stole my helmet? Um, look to your brother, Berta. Uh, Ronnie says, happy 4th. Zach says, happy Freedom Day. And <laughs> City of Black says, hides his new bowl for popcorn. Dude, there, there's got to be something for that. There's got to be a bowl for popcorn. In any case, Arthur Huxtake says, we don't need eyes for where we're going. Good reference. Very good reference. All right, buddy. Um, buddy says, happy 4th. I can't stay long. I'm going to go hang out with a friend. I'm going to get to see once every two weeks. Hey, man, spending time with your friends is real important. I know for me, um, it's kind of, with my new schedule, it's kind of a pain because um, if you guys are in Discord, I'm normally um, able to, I well, I used to be able to spend some time with uh, people in Discord, Um and I'm not able to do that as much as I used to be. And I was talking to somebody about that last night, actually. Well, not last night. Legitimately tonight. I haven't been to sleep yet. And um, I was telling them it's it's the one downside of the position that I have now where I don't get the time to spend with them like I used to. And that's the one thing that I really, really don't like. But at the same time, it's going to enable me to do a lot of stuff that I've been wanting to do for some time. And now I'm blind because I took my glasses off. Happy National Losing Fingers Day. Yes. Jonathan Hampton says, newbie. And a guy underneath the bridge, thank you. He says, double feature today. Happy, happy Adeptus Munitorum Day. Yes, it is. All right. So, who's ready to go? Who's ready to start? Nicholas. I'm doing okay. I'm kind of tired. I've got, I got the uh, part one and part two, and then I'm taking a short break. And going right into uh, Star Wars first. For, 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 I'm, I'm going straight into English lessons. That's what I'm going into. All right, X is in the chat. If you're ready, guys, let's go. So, um, last episode, <sighs> Doc in the hospitaler. It's wonderful. Yes, can't wait for you to start hating Nubby, Sir Skatari. Why would I ever hate Nubby? Uh, Martin, greetings from Germany. Well, what part of Germany are you in, bud? And um, I, I did not see what Josh Tompkins said. Oh, vacation. Okay. Well, I hope you had a good vacation. Or I hope you're still on vacation. That's, that's my own personal thing. Personal recommendation to everybody. If you ever have a chance, there's a small island off the coast of Sicily. Um, called Malta. If you have an absolute, if you have any chance to go to Malta at any point, I highly recommend it. I really highly recommend it. I was there for about five days in the early 2000s, and I loved it. 
and I'm hoping that it hasn't changed. Thank you, Slacker. Which, what do you mean, which one? Why are there six? Have I, did I miss something? Uh, I'm guessing I'm going to see. Mayu, glad you made it. And here we go. Yes, it is. It's a beautiful country. Hmm. Why are there six? What are you... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm hitting play. Let's go. The squad is getting a okay, tour Herb. of the impressively See large soon, shuttle they've just boarded from none other than their former squad mate, Nubby. Last they'd seen him, he'd been reassigned to quartermaster duties after his legs were removed by a treacherous interrogator. This happens. Now, a treacherous interrogator that he was in love with, by the way. Oh, he's happily stumping around on a pair of augmetic legs while proudly explaining how he's the mission's supply officer. This announcement is being met with considerable skepticism by Sarge, who is the only member of the squad actually listening. <laughs> Doc is paying far more attention to Nubby's shiny new metal legs mm. and is interrupting the rambling tour with questions about how they'd been attached. When Nubby doesn't provide any helpful answers, Doc asks Sarge to hold the little trooper up so he can take a look. <laughs> Meanwhile, Twitch's curiosity and paranoia are driving him to find out just what is inside the large metal container being loaded onto the shuttle. Cutter, who found the lack of sword-related topics in the tour incredibly boring, is helping the demolitions trooper by prying open one of the boxes. When the lid finally pops off, both guardsmen jump back and start swearing. Oh. Doc and Sarge, who is still holding Nubby up by the shoulders, come over to see what the matter is. Hey, Mr. Reich. When Sarge sees what's inside the container, as well as the identical markings on all the other containers, he starts shaking the suspended guardsman like an angry terrier. Nubby? Just, why the hell are we taking a few thousand servitors with us? The all-guardsman party buys a spaceship. Oh boy. So no shit there we were. No shit there we were. On a shuttle filled with tech priests and an army of servitors. Hey, on our way calf. to assist in the purchase of an entire warp-capable starship for our Inquisitor. Not a normal space transport, not a shuttle, not a flyer, but an entire damned warp ship. The smallest of which were typically over a kilometer long and worth more than a dozen regiments of guard. Hmm. And to top it all off, Nubby Nubs was standing there, proud as anything, telling the rest of us that he was in charge of the operation. <laughs> oh, God. It was completely unbelievable. Uh, thank you, Squire. Squire says, Good night from the Aussie lands, good sir. No spoilers, but when you hear the ship's name, I recommend you start thinking of synonyms. Oh, boy. Here we go. Thank you, Slacker. His legs are good craftsmanship or better. I see what you did there. <laughs> To clarify, it Thank wasn't you, unbelievable in the sense that we couldn't fathom how the universe could be so strange and cruel. We literally didn't believe a word Nubby said. Mm. No one with a scrap of intelligence would send him out to buy the recaf, much less a bloody warp ship. Yeah. Sure, we'd all trust Nubby at our back in a firefight any day, but the man was a petty thief a compulsive liar, right. and had actually been mistaken for a Gretchen on more than one occasion. Luckily, Twitch knows better. Or does he? Sarge told the trooper to stuff a sock in it, <laughs> and we all went to get a more realistic briefing from the tech priests that were coming with us. Okay. There seemed to be a lot of cogboys on the big cargo shuttle with us. Every room or hallway was filled with creepy metal men squawking at each other in binary. We found the one that Oak had implied was the head tech priest in a conference room surrounded by a bunch of subordinates. He was obviously holding some sort of conference or briefing, but we couldn't understand any of their robotic chatter. Sarge just 
stood there awkwardly, and then started loudly clearing his throat until a few cogboys were waved away to deal with us. <laughs> that became an annoying trend over our journey. The head tech priest and his senior flunkies would never talk to us directly. We were sure they could understand Gothic, but they just never seemed to speak in anything but their damned machine language. Every time we needed to talk to one of them, a junior cogboy would be called up to act as a translator or lead us away so we didn't disturb the senior techies. This did not endear them to us, and we didn't go out of our way to treat them any better. We did get pretty familiar with the junior tech priests, though. Well, not exactly familiar. There were a bunch of them, and it was damned hard to pick out which pile of metal tentacles was Brother Ticinius, and which was Brother Cassistus. <laughs> Woe betide be difficult. the poor guardsman who mistook Logus Guminio for Constructor Periphanes. Such a mistake was incredibly insulting, and a clear indication of our inferior intellect. Matters were not helped by their damned tendency to switch out their augmetics. Just when you get used to Arc Brother Lexi Mechanic Cogitus Boyus being the <laughs> tall bastard with the heavy duty servo arm, he'd swap it out for some sort of sparky tentacle job and replace his legs with treads or something. We would have gone crazy if it weren't for the two lowest ranking tech priests in the bunch Tech Acolytes Jim and Hannah. The two Acolytes were the most junior. Jim and Hannah, the tech acolytes. Ah, uh, okay. Tech priests on the mission, and were obviously Don't the mechanicus right. equivalent of the regimental gopher. Makes sense. Every time you saw them, they'd be carrying something, moving as fast as possible without running, or covered head to toe with grease and other less pleasant fluids. Mm-hmm. We liked Jim and Hannah. They were practically kids, had most of their original parts, and you could pronounce their names while drunk. <laughs> Best of all, they had a weary, put-upon attitude which warmed the khaki-colored blobs which passed for our souls. We quickly made them honorary guardsmen and began taking all of our questions to them. Sounds about right. Once we met Jim and Hannah, we were finally able to get the real details of our mission. The gist of it was that the tech priests and our squad were all being sent to discreetly purchase a second-hand warp ship, presumably so it could be used to carry around Oak's recruitment teams without causing a fuss. And they sent Nubby to do this. That's That, that just seems like a problem. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, my fellow cog bros. Yes. The, the sheer fact that they sent Nubby to do this just, it, it's already a problem. Um, loyal Cav, when children are more reliable than the chain of command. Okay, seriously, that's not that far off, okay? That's really not that far off. If anybody that's ever been in the military can tell you, sometimes a four year old is more reliable than your chain of command. Um, maybe <laughs> Adrian El Elmtis says, maybe Alfarius are the friends we made along the way. <laughs> To our collective relief, the Acolytes confirmed that Nubby was not in charge of the operation. Thank God. He was merely there to act as the public face for the purchase and general observer. His superiors in supply had already chosen the ship, negotiated a price range, gotten the funds into place, hired a navigator and astropath, okay. and handed Nubby a very explicit set of orders. The Head Majos and the other tech priests would handle everything else, and be more or less in command from the second the ship was deeded over and the original crew was evicted. There you go! They'd do the inspection, prep the ship for travel, and perform any repairs. Finally, once the priests deemed the ship ready for travel, they'd use their servitor army to fly the whole damned thing back to some secret Inquisition shipyard for a refit. There you go. This all made sense to us, but it was still a wonder that Nubby had been chosen for any part of this mission. 
He insisted that his superiors had recognized his acquisition skills and personal experience with ships like this. Not to mention his clever negotiation tactics and cunning mercantile mind. I'm beginning to think that Nubby really is a Gretchen. Bloody Magpie says, this time on Grand Theft Warp Drive. <laughs> Loyal Cav says, the tech priest grinds my gears, if you know what I mean. Why? Just, just why? It's too early for this. It's too early for this. Um, Sir Skatori Bush says, hast thou tried pressing the pressing the rune of activation? You know what? At one point, my camera completely stopped working, and it was early on, and it was like way a long time ago. And um, I actually cited, I went through the entire Tech Priest uh, troubleshooting guide, <laughs> and nothing worked. <laughs> I actually did it on microphone, because for whatever reason, my camera just completely stopped working. It's back when I had the abomination that was possessed. This was bullshit, and we all knew it. Mm -hmm. To a man, the rest of us believed that he'd been sent because no one would ever look at him and think inquisitorial agent. Yeah. The rest of us were there to act as backup for Nubby. Officially, this was because every procurer in the field was supposed to have a bunch of trustworthy and discreet agents to assist them. At first, we wondered just why we had been chosen over other available agents. But after we figured out why Nubby had been sent, it was plain as day why we were sent. Yeah. Obviously, our squad had been chosen because we all looked like the sort of incompetent ex-guard goons mm. that a complete cretin would employ as bodyguards. There you go. Thanks, Oak. Now, we traveled a fair bit during our careers in the Inquisition, but this trip was something else. This time, we didn't have our own quiet section of the ship. Instead, we were surrounded by dozens of cogboys running around preparing an army of servitors for crewing a warp ship. Everywhere you went, there'd be tech priests chattering at each other, chanting and lighting incense, welding random pieces of metal or doing incredibly unsettling things to their servitors. Oh, God, I didn't need to hear that. Thank you, Slacker. It sounds like someone angered their local tech priest. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I did... Ugh, that, that mental image is... I don't need to know what the tech priests do to their servitors. I really just don't. Thank you, Slacker. The ship itself was some sort of Mechanicus transport, and the quarters available made us all think wistfully of the berths the Rupert had gotten for us. Hmm. Apparently, when you become a full tech priest, you stop desiring beds fancier than a wide metal shelf, or food that actually has flavor. <coughs> also, Mechanicus toilets can best be described as terrifying. <laughs> We all tried to stay out of the way and keep Hey, Dark, how's it going? But Welcome it home from just work, didn't bud. work. We always seemed to be underfoot or under tread or under anti-grav skimmer. There simply wasn't room for anyone that wasn't part of whatever mad plan the techies were all following. Mm. Cargo haulers would bolt through us during morning PT. Random tech priests would shout at us if we touched or sat on anything and our quarters were randomly repurposed for storage. Sometimes while we were still in them. No man should wake up in a dark room surrounded by 30 deactivated servitors. Mm -mm. Oh, no. None of us were happy, but Twitch had the worst of it. Yeah! He just couldn't function well without a secured perimeter. We were about ready to outright fortify a cargo bay, and try to hold it off against the Cogboys, when Doc got his idea. He suggested that the only way to survive the trip was to become part of the pattern. We spent the rest of the voyage following Jim and Hannah around like lost puppies. We slept where and when they slept. 
we ate when they ate, and did our best to help with whatever unpleasant task they were working on. Well, that's a good team effort. We probably weren't very helpful, but it kept us alive and relatively sane. Keyword. It was an immense relief when we finally reached our destination. We piled onto a shuttle and rode to a local orbital station, where a few scribes were waiting to brief us on the purchase. We blew them all off and slept for about 20 hours in the blissful quiet of our <laughs> cowboy-free rental rooms. The briefings and preliminary negotiations took about a week, and aside from Nubby, none of us really had to do anything. We more or less hung out in hallways while various scribes became incredibly frustrated with Nubby. There were no assassination attempts, no cultist infiltrators, no orc commando raids, and certainly no gene stealer attacks. Thank Just God. a bunch of boring guard duty while Nubby drove various expensive lawyers and financial experts into a state of incoherent rage. <laughs> One of them did actually try to kill him but since Nubby had just stolen the man's wallet, it was perfectly understandable. We did pay a little attention to what was going on. Guard duty was boring, and they weren't really hiding the documents or diagrams. Most of it was legal gibberish, ancient trade logs, and figures about engine strength and storage capacity, none okay. of which we even tried to understand. But there were some nice pictures... From what we saw, the ship was a small one, only two kilometers long, and was... Small. Rather plain looking. Just the sort of ship for traveling around unnoticed. The negotiations continued, and some of the tech priests were being sent over to inspect the ship. Okay. They took a while, but confirmed that the ship met all requirements... That done with, all that was left was the final meeting between Dubby and the current owner of the vessel. Some fancy rooms were rented out for the deal, and Nubby was crammed into a frilly suit, complete with powdered wig. <laughs> it was probably supposed to make him look like a dashing imperial nobleman, but it really just made him look like a Gretchen in a dress. That's what I was thinking. It was hard not to laugh as we followed him to the meeting. And when we saw the man selling the ship, it became nearly impossible. If Nubby was a Gretchen in a dress, then the seller was a giant squig in a suit. <laughs> the man was practically spherical. Com oh, it's Herman von Straub. Nice. Thank you, Slacker. Small, so says the sailor. It's two kilometers long. It always amuses me. It always amuses me. Oh. You, like when we talk about the sizes of ships in 40K. Because the size of the ships in 40K is just asininely huge. Like, um, it's just asininely huge. Like, compared to other universes like Star Wars, the... Star De a Star Destroyer is two kilometers. Is not even two kilometers long. I don't think. And let's not even get to talking about Trek, where you know the longest ship they have is under a kilometer. Uh, let's see. Context: The Rogue Trader is based on the Captain from Wally to help you with your imagination. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else? Uh, let's see. I mean, scale. Aquila says. I mean, scale is about the one thing where 40k is actually pretty realistic for realistic sci-fi. Okay. Comically clumsy, and honked like a goose when he talked. He radiated an aura of incompetence, and was followed by a cadre of thugs who all had the same suffused expressions we did. Hmm. The worst part was that the man obviously thought of himself as a rogue traitor and tried to dress the part. Oh my god. He must have gone through some catalog and ordered one Thank of everything. Thank you, Slacker. He had the gaudy coat with epaulettes. Let's go. The large hat with a feather in it. Let's go. The cane that obviously contained a sword. Yes. And just to top it off, there was a cybernetic parrot perched on his shoulder. 
The problem was that while most rogue traders ooze confidence in danger, this one just oozed. <laughs> okay, because of the parrot thing, we had a U.S. president that had a parrot on his shoulder, Andrew Jackson. When Andrew Jackson's funeral happened, they had to take the parrot away from the funeral because the parrot wouldn't stop swearing. We'd seen, fought, and redecorated a bathroom with the head of a real rogue trader before. This guy was more like a kid playing dress-up. We just barely managed to keep our faces straight while Nubby and the wannabe greeted each other. Both of them were handed the relevant documents by their scribes okay. and headed into a private room to complete the deal. Okay. The second the door closed behind them, the fat man's guards cracked up, and we did likewise. <laughs> it was just too much to bear. Both sets of scribes just shared a miserable look and settled down to wait. The meeting took a surprisingly long time, and we all started to get nervous. Every part of the deal had been hammered out beforehand, and this was just supposed to be a matter of signing off. Did Nubby fuck this up? Emperor only knew what Nubby was getting up to in there. Nubby stole his hat. Neither of them hit their panics buttons, though, so we sat tight, and eventually both men came out alive and relatively well. Nubby had a disturbingly smug look, and the seller seemed rather flustered, but both of them insisted that everything was sorted out. The scribes did a final review of the signed documents, got into a brief, whispered argument with Nubby and the fat man, and then loudly confirmed that everything was in order. The okay. seller's scribes said that all of their men would be off the ship within 30 hours, and the whole party made a rather hasty exit. That done with, we headed back to our quarters and passed the word on to the tech priests. The cog boys confirmed that they were ready to board the ship and take over as soon as the former crew was out of the way. Okay. From there on out, it was entirely their mission. We were just passengers and observers. All our squad had to do was keep out of the way until we arrived at the shipyard and someone came to collect us. The tech priest told us to stay in our quarters until they had their servitors in place, so we finished our business with the scribes, settled in for a few days of relaxation on the station, and asked Nubby what had happened during the meeting. According to him, the former captain had been a terrible negotiator and was easily haggled down. The little bugger was smug as hell about the whole thing and expected a big thank you from Oak for saving him a few billion thrones. None of us really believed him. No, I don't either. Nubby was always full of that sort of shit, but the scribes were happy, so it wasn't really our problem. In retrospect, not grilling Nubby and finding out exactly what sort of deal he got, or how he managed to get it, was a tremendous mistake. I got a feeling. A few days of idleness later, a shuttle was sent for us, and we were taken to the new edition of Oak's fleet. The free trader Occurrence Border. Occurrence border? Occurrence border. Oh, God. Occurrence border. Synonyms for occurrence border. Let's go. Because he said start making synonyms for it. Occurrence border. Oh, God. Oh, no. As we approached the ship, everyone clustered around the windows to get a good look at our purchase. A lot of things about the occurrence border grabbed the eye. There were massive tanks for hauling fluids, the impressive arrays of docking hatches along the cargo bays, the odd variations in color and design of the hull, but mostly there was the fact that the ship was about half as long as the diagram said it should be. No! Just fucking no! Oh god, this is gonna be a hellhole.
This is going to be an absolute 150% hellhole, I already know. Occurrence border? Occurrence border. You will get, like, synonyms for occurrence border. Let's go. Like, I already know what this is. Thank you, Slacker. The biggest ship Imperium Man has is the Gloriana class, which is anywhere from 20 kilometers to about 30. The biggest is the Invincible Reason, the Dark Angels flagship, which is 28 kilometers. Actually, there is one ship bigger. There's one class that's actually bigger than a Gloriana class, but they no longer exist. They were all destroyed in the Horus Heresy. And that was the class of the Furious Abyss and its two sister ships that the Word Bearers both had and lost all of them. Because they suck. I really do appreciate it, Slacker. Uh, would you rather serve on the Occurrence Border? No. Or the Debt Collector. I would be on the Debt Collector instantaneously. Uh, just wait and it gets worse. Uh, Debt Collector. <laughs> Death Corps Trooper says, Debt Collector, at least it has a cool captain. Aquila says, Debt Collector, that way I'm happening to other people and things are happening to me. Um, Mayu, yes, Event Horizon, that's exactly what I was thinking. Is a great horror movie that seems like it would work as a very early showing of work travel that a Gellerfield. Actually, the director said it was as close as he could, but Games Workshop wouldn't give him the license to make it. Also remember, which half of Event Horizon got lost at the end of the movie? Oh, no! War in the Phalanx is more of a, um... The Phalanx is more of a space station than anything else that's actually mobile. I don't even know if you'd be able to call that a ship. It's not... It, it technically is, but Jesus. Alright, here we go. This... Oh, God. Oh, God. It was amazing, really. The Occurrence Border mostly followed the standard Imperial ship layout. Okay. Large engines in the tail... Control tower rising above the rear of the ship, long and slightly skinny body, except the bow was completely gone. <laughs> the ship just ended halfway through the body in a giant patchwork of scrap metal. That's bad. It looked like someone had grabbed the ship, cut it with a giant cleaver, and then smashed the ragged edge flat. Oh, God. As one, we all turned to look at Nubby who muttered something about good value for cost and tried to sidle away. Nubby, you fucking idiot. Uh, Dark Innovator says, I read somewhere that the Dark Angels fleet had a number of Gloriana-class ships during the Crusade. They did. Um, the Invincible Reason was one. I cannot remember offhand the name. I think they had four. I believe they had four. But, um... I think they've lost two at this point. I'm, I could be wrong on this, though. It took a lot of shaking and yelling to get all the details out of Nubby. Yes, I'd love Apparently, to. Apparently, well, the front fell off. The entire front of the vessel. Fell the fuck off! two-kilometer, warp-capable ship, which had just been purchased for a staggering amount of money on behalf of the bloody Inquisition fell off. He huh? said it doesn't happen often. Just a sort of occasional time-to-time -time thing. Overall, it is a very safe ship. In fact, in the whole lifetime of the ship, it only happened once. Or twice. Well, maybe three times. Definitely no more than four. But the important thing was that it would never, ever happen again. Nubby! The previous captain had fixed the problem for good by installing the special made custom prow after the last incident. We all eyed the mushroom-shaped pile of slagged scrap on the front end of the ship and contemplated just what Oak would do to us. Airlock, Nubby. Now. It would probably involve an excruciator and an airlock. Maybe not in that order, either. The rest of the flight was split between yelling at Nubby and staring at the ship with a sort of morbid curiosity. The closer we got, the more the imperfections became apparent. There were scars and burns, holes and gouges, 
and the most bizarre set of repairs and additions imaginable. It's an orc ship! The entire ship must have been stripped off and replaced with spare parts one piece at a time until nothing of the original was left visible. It's an orc ship! It was a wonder that the thing flew at all. Doc suggested that we might not get yelled at by Oak for any of this, because there was no way we'd survive the warp voyage home in this hole. You're not! Eventually, the shuttle docked, and we walked into one of the occurrence border's more intact cargo bays. Hannah the Cog Girl was waiting to guide us to our quarters. She led us through a maze of tunnels and gave us a rundown of situation on the way. Most of the servitors were in place, the navigator and astropath were on board, and the last few repairs and calibrations would be made during the trip. After a while, Sarge cautiously asked her what the tech priests thought about the state of the ship. Her response surprised us. She cheerily informed us that the entire vessel was an abomination in the eyes of the Onisaya and perfectly met all requirements. That second part was a little confusing, but according to her, the whole point was to acquire a thoroughly disreputable vessel that was still capable of running. The Cogboys didn't care if half the ship was missing. If the cargo bays leaked atmosphere, or if most of the ship was pieced together from old wrecks. As long as it could travel through the warp, they were happy. Why? After all, they were just here to take it to the shipyard. The priests were the ones who would be refitting it for inquisitorial use. Nubby perked up at this, but oh Sarge God. reminded him that even if the tech priests were happy, the people who were paying for the ship and its refit probably wouldn't be. I doubt it. As we walked, all of us noticed dozens of papers fixed to panels, doors, controls, and such. At first, we thought they were the usual purity seals or mechanicus prayers, but then Twitch stopped and actually read a few. Each one said something like, this control panel governs the flow of plasma through bays D3, S15. No one remembers why we have plasma going through there, but if you shut them off, engines 3 and 7 stop working. The gravity in this corridor is tilted 37 degrees to the left, and do not ever touch this button. The last one showed up a lot. When we asked Hannah about the notes, she lowered her voice and advised us to take them very seriously. Oh my god. They must have been left by the former crew and were incredibly helpful. But we were never to mention any of them to the more senior tech priests. Oh my god. The cog boys were trying to ignore them since they didn't need advice from anyone outside the priesthood, but unfortunately the notes were far more accurate than their own scans. The senior priests were taking it as a personal insult every time they had to refer to one of the notes to fix a problem. We all chuckled at that and promised to read any notes we came across. <laughs> Eventually, we arrived in a... Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, The Abyss class were technically never Imperial Man ships... But the largest ship the Imperium men had was the Emperor's personal flagship, the Imperator Sonum, which had been disguised as dwarfing even the Gloriana class. I, th I thought his personal flagship was the Bucephalus. I thought his personal flagship was Bucephalus. Am I completely wrong on that, you guys? Or is that like another, is there another name for that? And yes, you are right. Technically, the Abyss class were not Imperial Manchus because they were never really signed off on. And I hated that book too because it was retconned immediately. Like in the first paragraph of the next book that came after Furious Abyss, it was completely retconned. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just, okay, okay. So that makes sense now. That makes sense. Sunfi says it's Professor Oak and having his own space Hulk sounds like an incredibly oaky thing. 
Sunfi, you should be purged for that. <sighs> that what that that pun wasn't even that didn't even take much effort. Can a glowing not good not have two say <laughs> shit not god have two. Yes. One for work, one for fun, Aquila. Alright, continuing on. Cluster of But okay, they have half a ship right now. Half a one. Thank you, Slacker. What are they gonna do with oh, okay rooms that Jim the Acolyte was clearing out with the help of a bunch of servitors? He suggested that these would make good quarters pointed us towards a storage chest with some relatively edible rations in it, handed us a data slate with a crude map of the ship, and recommended that we stay out of the way of the servitors and tech priests. Please. Once we were settled, the two acolytes scampered off to their next task. Sarge booted up the data slate, and about ten seconds after Jim and Hannah had disappeared into the giant maze of metal that was our ship, we realized that none of us knew how to read a three-dimensional map. The ensuing argument over whose job it had been to check the map earlier, and what we were going to do now, was interrupted by the ship's speakers blaring to life. There was a painful burst of binary, well, at least they were. followed by a monotone voice telling all hands to prepare for warp transport. Oh god. Then the universe went Glorp and tasted like the color purple for a second. Why does it why does it taste purple? That's a Lulu from League of Legends reference if I ever heard one. Thank you, Dragon of Dragons. Dragon of Dragons says, of course the local of course the toaster boys refuse to take sensible advice from anything not themselves. Have you ever seen a religious group take advice from somebody that isn't in their religious group? I don't know. I, I don't know. I appreciate it, Dra Dragon of Dragons. And this is where it, I... F Rumi Gracia says, Funny thing, Japanese Google Translate translates orc as oak. We're watching something by weebs. This is disturbing. <laughs> the one good thing you could say about the situation was that no one was trying to kill us. That's always At a least, good sign. not on purpose, anyway. On the other hand, we were cruising through the warp in a twisted heap of scrap held together with tape and spit, and none of us even knew where in the ship we were Where's my no shit where we were? Our map. Where's my no shit there we were? Now, being lost is a long-standing guard tradition. Yes, it is. But this was ridiculous. It's hard enough to navigate in two dimensions with an accurate map and a directional finder. Three with an unreadable map and no way to tell which way you're facing is just unfair. <laughs> Without the ration bars, we might have actually starved to death in our own ship, or at least been reduced to hunting the servitors for food. After our quarters were secured, we started trying to track down one of the tech priests. We wanted to know where everyone else was, what was going on, and how the hell to read our map. <laughs> our comms didn't work for shit inside all this metal, and we didn't have access to the ship's communication systems. So our search had to be done the old-fashioned way, on foot with hand-drawn maps and trail markers. We didn't feel like passengers on a ship. It was more like we were a recon force plotting hostile terrain. Or you're on the spaceship to hell going down. And boy was the terrain hostile. There were gravity shifts, depressurized sections of ship, exposed power conduits, rooms filled with hot plasma, and dozens of other hazards. Only those helpful little notes kept us alive. Oh my Still, god. Even though everything they said was helpful, the notes themselves were a bit disconcerting. I bet. They tended to be a little too precise, and Twitch swore that more of them were appearing in areas we'd already been through. Oh, God. Doc was leading the patrol that found the first tech priest. Unfortunately, he refused to speak to us and ducked through a hatch, which locked behind him. The second priest we found wasn't given the chance. Doc and Nubby covered the exits while Cutter tackled the cogboy. 
Holding someone at gunpoint and asking them for technical support and directions probably <laughs> isn't the officially sanctioned way of doing this sort of thing. No, probably at not. Least, not when they're on your side. But damned if it didn't work well. The conversation was a little awkward, though. The tech priest turned out to be one of the ones who had briefed us during the trip and was perfectly willing to talk to us. We did apologize. Once we learned how to use the map, we realized it was mostly empty space, but it did cover most of the important parts of the ship. It mapped out some of the bigger loading bays, the quarters the techies were using, and the locations of several critical systems, and the giant spinal shipping corridor and freight lifts that most of the servitors used. Thank you, Dragon of Dragons. Dragon of Dragons says, Not today, skin bags! Which is fairly accurate. Oh, I'm welcome back, Mr. Reich. The best part was that the terrified tech priest showed us how to fill in the blank Thank spots you, and add notes, which meant that we no longer had to depend on Doc's hand-drawn maps to get us back to our base. Yay! Not that Doc was a bad artist, mind you. He just had a little trouble figuring out how to draw a corridor that angled up and left while its gravity shifted to the right wall. With the map in hand, our recon patrol released the tech priest to go grease servitors or whatever, and went off to find the two helpful techies. Yes, the ones with names we can actually pronounce. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says meat bags need sleep eventually. I know that's the case because I'm going to be going to sleep here as soon as possible for me. It is... Uh, I slept in a good little bit yesterday in preparation for this, but it's, it's I'm still tired. Uh, Hobbit, yeah, you slept in. Something you really get to do. I know the feeling, bud. The rough plan was to get a hand with the comm situation from the Acolytes, okay. but unfortunately they weren't in the quarters indicated on the map. Hmm. Doc was dithering about whether to keep searching or wait for them to return, when Nubby suggested getting them to come to us. Oh, God. Based on our past experiences, Nubby argued, if we just annoyed enough of the senior tech priests or started breaking things... One of the acolytes would be sent to deal with us. Why? Doc watched in horror as Nubby and Cutter went to work. Oh, God. But he didn't actually do anything to stop them. Three gutted cogitator terminals, two corridors flooded with coolant, another filled with less pleasant substances, and a dismembered maintenance server later, Sarge's comm bead came to life. Why? An exhausted-sounding tech acolyte Jim asked him to pick up his team before someone killed them. <laughs> we still couldn't use the ship's comms. The acolyte said it was restricted to the priests for some techy reason. Mm. But our comm beads were being boosted by the larger system. Combined with the functioning map and Jim and Hannah's personal contact codes, we had everything we needed to survive the rest of the ship. So Survive we all went back to base nice. to get a night's sleep. Well, if not a night's, then at least a solid ten hours worth. The ship's light systems seemed to be on several different clocks, and the ones in our quarters dimmed on a three-hour cycle. Hmm. Twitch eventually shot them out, and we just used our own lamps. Now, just to be clear, no one in the squad was a sissy, and none of us ever had trouble with warp travel before. <laughs> yeah, like, I press X to doubt. Thank you, Aquila. When the, Aquila says, when the terrible idea is the least bad that you have. You know what? One of my favorite quotes is from Patton, and General Patton of the Fourth Army in World War II, and he said a bad plan executed now is better than a perfect plan executed later so he was a big fan of that so i guess i guess thank you slacker i'm going to gut a meat bag he says <laughs> uh, I, you know what they did gut a server tour so there you go thank you quill and slacker appreciate it 
We'd all face down something. some incredibly weird and scary shit during our time in the Guard. Yes. Not to mention what we'd seen as inquisitorial goons. Our nerves might not have been made of steel, but they were definitely iron or possibly some good quality bronze. Hey, there you go. That said, the nightmares we had that night were bloody terrifying. <laughs> They were the sort of nightmares that take your every fear and failing and rub them in your face while you struggle to wake up and tell yourself it's all a dream. <sighs> we all woke up covered in sweat when one of Twitch's perimeter alarms went off. Oh, that's always good. We didn't even check what set off the alarm. All of us just sat there and thanked the Emperor for Twitch's paranoia. <laughs> After a few minutes, Doc got up and pulled the yellow note off the inside of our door. It said, In case of bad dreams, check Gellerfield integrity. That Do it now! That note had not been there when we went to sleep. Oh, that's disturbing. Alright. So that was part one, guys. That was part one. Now, I need a few seconds because in the 30-ish minutes that this that I've had everything closed and the air conditioner off. It has gotten hot in here. No, Ronnie, Twitch sat there and saw his bag of tricks empty. He didn't have any proximity lines. He didn't have anything like that. That's what Twitch, Twitch saw. Doc saw. Doc saw the hospitaler that he's in love with on a date with Nubby. One second, guys. I'm going to go see if I can't do something about this heat in this room because it's fucking hot. All right, so, um, yeah, it was, it is hot in this room right now. I think it's like 90 outside and it's approaching that in this room right now. So I've got the, you know, I got a little bit of cool air coming in, so it's good. Um, Ronnie says, poor hospital or no one deserves to be on a date with Nubby. <laughs> All right, part two, who's ready to go? Yes. All right, Hobbit. Thank you, Hobbit. Hobbit says, oh, almost forgot. Happy Independence Day to all. Okay. Yep, it is Independence Day. Uh, Hobbit says, we had a thunderstorm come through last night. And it's only supposed to be 71 degrees today, but it's been hot a week. <sighs> you know, I used to have, I used to do all my recording in another room, but this one just like borders everything and I have all this noise in the back so that I kind of regret moving over here but at the same time you know I don't but you know it, it is what it is the worst thing about this the worst thing about this room is it gets ridiculously hot here um, so it's just a pain Sarge probably sees heavy and Chris dying to be honest oh guard on her bridge guy on her bridge uh, F in the chat for crisp and heavy because that makes me sad. Here we go. All guards and party. Discount spaceship part two. Electric Boogaloo now in stores. While the note's sudden appearance was mysterious as hell, none of them. The sun is a deadly laser. Had steered us wrong so far, and this one was pointing us towards what might be a very serious problem. On the list of incredibly horrible things that can go wrong during warp transit, Gellerfield failure is pretty much at the top. Yes. The Gellerfield generator is literally the anti-getting devoured by demonic horrors device. Yes. It is rather important that it keeps performing that function at all times while traveling through the warp. Vastly. 
The squad kitted up while Sarge calmed Jim and asked nicely if he'd heard about anything about problems with the Geller field. We all watched as Sarge's face started turning white, <laughs> then red, oh boy. then purple. Oh boy. We bailed out of the room just ahead of the explosion of rage. <laughs> and even through the sealed hatch, we heard Sarge taking out a lot of frustration on poor Jim. Poor Jim. The high points included. What do you mean, which one? Why are there six? Who in their right mind would install a damaged Gellerfield generator? What? Who in their right mind would install six damaged Gellerfield generators? No, there is not a difference between damaged and refurbished. What do you mean it was in the technical briefing? What technical briefing for who? Where's Nubby? I'll strangle murder that little bastard. Good deal, I'll show him a good deal. At the Press X to throw Nubby out of an airlock right the fuck now. Oh my god, that is beyond stupid. At that point, Sarge burst through the hatch, and Nubby decided it was a good time to go check what had set off the outer perimeter alarm, while the rest of us restrained the irate Nonco. Fucking run! Eventually, we got Sarge calmed down enough to speak coherently, and he explained the whole messed up situation to us. Oh my god. Apparently, the ship's Geller field had been scrapped and replaced by several smaller models that had been scavenged from Emperor Noseware. Why? There were three along the length of the ship, one near the bridge, and two covering the top and bottom decks. We were currently near the one in the bow, and from the look of things, it was on the fritz. Jim said he'd take a look at it, and suggested that we move our quarters farther back into the coverage of one of the other generators. That sounded like a good idea, but we decided to take it a step further. We weren't just going to find some random rooms in the next section of the ship. We were going to hike our asses down to that Gellerfield generator, set up camp, and bloody well sleep on it. Uh, the, uh, that's a good idea. There was not going to be any screwing around with this nightmare business. Sack time is practically sacred, and anything that disturbs it must be immediately dealt with. Now this is pod racing! A guardsman who can't fall asleep the second the perimeter is secure is not a true guardsman. Oh my god. We packed up our quarters. Rations, field gear, traps, munitions... Everything we had was coming with us. As Twitch pulled down his perimeter defenses, he found the triggered alarm tucked away in the side of a corridor with a note that said, Please do not obstruct the corridors. <laughs> that was a little disconcerting. That is But was something worrying. we could worry about later. The hike aft went pretty quickly after we navigated up to the big spinal corridor. It was really the most comfortable way to get around the ship even if it was filled with servitors. Why Before are there long, six? we were in a giant room filled with arcane machinery and glowing shit that had a note on it that said, Midship Gellerfield Generator. Do not ever touch. Ever. This means you. <laughs> on the door. You'd shit. think it would be uncomfortable sleeping inside a room filled with sparking machinery and delicate devices that you must not touch. Oh my god. But it really wasn't. The noise was considerably less than an artillery barrage, and unlike Twitch's little perimeter traps, everything we needed to avoid was either very obvious or labeled. Mm-hmm. We were all quite happy with our new base and slept like babies that night. The next few days were relatively peaceful. We all felt that enough stuff had gone wrong for the shoe to qualify as dropped. All that was left to do was make ourselves as comfortable as possible for the rest of the trip. Each of us kept busy in our own ways, whether it was exploring the ship and working on the map, helping Jim and Hannah, or compulsively fortifying the perimeter. Oh, Hobbit, stop it. We made it almost a week before the next crisis. Nice. 
One morning, as Sarge was going through his daily drills with Cutter, Nubby poked his head in and asked if Twitch was allowed to keep his unused explosives in the generator room. A few minutes later, both of them were examining an impressive pile of ordnance that was sitting out of the way behind some glowing pillars. Oh, and a God. few minutes after Damn that, it. everyone was called in for a good old-fashioned safety lecture and public reaming. Yes. The lecture came to a sudden stop when Twitch looked at the pile and informed us that the explosives weren't his, and were definitely armed. Someone was trying to blow up our base, and for once, it wasn't us. You know what? I'm not surprised. I really am not surprised here. This was deeply disturbing. Really? As Twitch went about disarming the explosives, he gave the rest of us a pretty detailed critique. The bombs had been there for a fairly long time, were set up for remote detonation, and had been installed by someone who was nowhere near as good as Twitch. <laughs> a little thinking led us to believe that the explosives had been placed by someone fairly familiar with the ship, but not with blowing things up. Also, there was probably a few more bombs around. Otherwise, why bother with the remote detonator? Mm -hmm. While Twitch finished removing the explosives, Sarge called the Acolytes and explained the situation. Jim and Hannah were pretty impressed by the discovery, and the call was quickly kicked upstairs. Then their superiors kicked us upstairs again, <coughs> and again, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. until finally we were talking to the ever-unresponsive head tech priest. The Cogton, as it were. The Cogton? Of the horrible death trap we were all flying on. <laughs> For the fifth or sixth time, Sarge explained that Someone had mined key components of the ship we were all on, mm -hmm. and it might be a good idea to do something about it. The Cogton did not dignify us with a response, and instead rattled off a bunch of binary at the other tech priests on the line. I am under the absolute conviction that these people are fucking idiots. Like, beyond idiotic. Because why you would not catch me on a ship with a faulty Gellerfield generator first off. There is so much wrong with this. There is so much wrong with all of this. There was a lot of the stupid cogboy screeching, and it <laughs> sounded like they were taking the situation fairly seriously. Well, good. At least someone is. None of them told us anything, though. Eventually, we got tired of them talking over our heads, and Sarge suggested that Perhaps the resident demolitions expert should look into the matter. That'd be Twitch. Maybe Twitch and his good buddies, you know, the guys who found the bombs in the first place, should check out the other Gellerfield generators and engines and such. This actually got a response. A horribly distorted voice told us to stand down and stay away from his machines. Oh, and God. then we were disconnected from the channel. <laughs> That's gratitude for you. I know, right? About ten minutes later, a massive series of explosions shook the ship. Yay! Bloody tech priests. Now, I don't care, we Tyler. know a fair bit about explosions. Every veteran guardsman does. And we were pretty damn sure that five bombs the size of the one we just defused had gone off. To us, that suggested that the explosives had all been linked to go off when someone screwed up while defusing one of them. Please tell me they're not around the other Gellerfield generators. Just, just tell me that. Thank you, Slacker. He says, Slacker says, it's not just a faulty Gellerfield generator, it's six faulty Gellerfield generators. What the fuck is wrong with these people? It's so disturbing. Oh, thank you, Slacker, but good God, what's wrong with these people? Them. So chances were that the ship was down a few cogboys and major systems. Pretty much. We weren't really concerned about that first point, but the second was worrying. I will Depending be. Depending on which systems had gone down, we were in for a whole spectrum of unpleasantness, nah. ranging from sudden fiery death 
to less sudden chilly death uh. to lingering insane death. Sarge decided that it was probably a good idea to figure out which one we were headed for. Uh. While the rest of us got our weapons ready, Sarge tried to calm the two acolytes. The contact code for Jim still wasn't letting us through. Mm -hmm. Whatever the Cogton had done to kick us out seemed fairly permanent. But after a few tries, he was able to get a hold of Hannah. Yay. The poor Cog girl was not cut out for this stuff and sounded like she was on the brink of tears. Tears or oil? Slackers, thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, at least it wasn't the reactors. At this point, I don't think there would be a difference, Slacker. I just don't think there will be a difference. This is a ship of the damned. <laughs> and they bought it. Do you okay, so seriously, do you think that do you think the squig do you think the squig road trader gave them half off? Do you think he gave them half off? Come on. Come on. Oh god, this thing sucks. Oh god, this is bad. Luckily, Sarge knew how to deal with shell hey, shocked Wandy. rookies and with Doc's help, managed to calm her down enough to get a status report. The news was not good. I doubt it is. The Gellerfield generators that covered the gaps in the top and bottom decks were completely destroyed. And both the fore and aft ones were damaged. Oh, come on. Only the generator on. we were sitting on and the one up near the bridge were undamaged. And between them and the two slightly damaged ones... There was just enough coverage to keep the whole ship from turning into a miniature demon world. <laughs> it was still a very bad idea to stay in the warp longer than necessary. When Sarge asked Hannah how soon we were dropping out of the warp to do repairs, the poor girl dissolved into tears and broke the real bad news. The warp drive was offline. The warp drive was the insanely complex device that moved the ship from boring, empty, die of asphyxiation or starving space to horrible, demon-filled, die insane choking on your own intestines warp space. Of course, the whole point of this is that there are much higher speed limits in the warp or something. What's a little demonic incursion if it gets you there faster, right? Oof! Oof! <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, that is a little unfair. Can I get a no shit, no shit, there we were? Can I get a no shit, there we were for this? Because there needs to be one. The difference between a 200 year and two week journey is pretty significant. But we were understandably bitter about the whole thing. Aquila says, thank you, Aquila. Aquila says, gentlemen, it's time to bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. Yes, it's past that time. It's way past that time. It is so far past, like, look, seriously, now you're trapped. Like, <laughs> you're, in the, you're in the warp with half a ship. You can't get out of the warp, and you have two... You have two Gellerfield generators that were bought on discount from the bargain bin. You're shitted. It's over. You're shitted. Oh my god. Thank you, Quilla. Hobbit says whoever Hobbit, thank you. Hobbit says whoever bought the ship just wanted to film Event Horizon 2. No shit, bro. No shit. I want to see Sam Reams. I want to see Sam Reem show up with a cut-up fucking face. Let's go. Thank you, Hobbit. And thank you, Slacker. When your tech priest breaks down on a when your tech priest breaks down on the sh on a ship in the warp, you have major issues. We are past major issues at this point. Oh my God, this is where the fun begins. Maybe they should try spinning. That's a good trick. Oh my God, this is fucking horrible. Oh. God, thank you, Slacker. Hey, let, let, oh God, uh, I don't, Tyler. I don't care if they're refurbished. I don't give a shit. I don't care. There's certain things that you just don't buy if they've been de de are defective or refurbished or whatever. Like you seriously, would you go out and buy a pack of refurbished condoms? I don't think so. 
don't do that. You just don't do things like this. I, I, I don't. Oh my God. Cheers and Orc and Waves Chopper. Yeah, Obsidian. That, that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah, Fox the Fox. There are capybaras in RimWorld. It's awesome. The problem was that if your warp drive breaks down while you're in the warp, you don't just pop back into reality. No. No. You're stuck there until someone fixes it. If they can fix it, that is. Otherwise, you might as well skip right to the insanity, cannibalism, and demon worshipping and save a little time. Things were bad. Things were very bad. Hobbit says, uh, uh, thank you, Hobbit. Hobbit says, choose current situation or fight chaos space marines. Space marines. Give me the space marines. Give me the space marines right the fuck now. That's not even a decision. Because at least then, they're... <coughs> well, actually, it depends on the chapter. As long as it's not like Night Lords. As long as it's not like Night Lords. But they could have been much worse. We weren't dead yet, and yet is the we had operative a word. moderately functional Geller field. The plasma engines were still running fine, and we were damn well going to believe that the warp drive was repairable unless the Emperor himself showed up and told us it wasn't. We got our shit together, mm. armed the lethal perimeter defenses, and put up a few signs to warn anyone that trying to get near the Geller field generator without our help was just a very painful method of suicide. We were going to hike our asses down to the warp drive and take a look at it in person, because as far as we could tell, no one else here was competent enough to do it. Of course, none of us had any idea how to fix a warp drive, or even what one looked like. No. But we weren't going to let some minor thing like that stop us. Oh god, it's bad when That's the guardsmen want to fix the warp drive. not we didn't understand the limits of our knowledge or skills. None of us were going to try and fix the machinery ourselves Thanks. unless we had to. We'd simply start grabbing tech priests and throwing them at the problem until they fixed it. <laughs> now, we were perfectly aware that the Cogton and the rest of the techies were probably trying to fix the problem but they really hadn't impressed us with how they handled the explosives. No. We felt that a little oversight from the few people on board who hadn't had the common sense part of their brain replaced with a little box of screws might help things along. Oh god, that's a bunch of guardsmen saying that. That's that's almost wor- that that's There is so much fuck no going on right now with this, it's not even funny. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, I wouldn't want to fight Night Lords or Word Bearers. You know what? Neither would I. Because the Word Bearers, they would do... Oh, God. Ugh. That question just opened up a whole can of worms. Here we go. Our <laughs> Ronnie. Hey, Feral World, go fix the reactor. Yeah. First instinct was to grab one of the Acolytes. Unfortunately, Hannah had been near a blast and was trapped in a room up in the bow of the ship, That's and bad. we still couldn't contact Jim. We didn't really have time to go retrieve either of them, so we figured that we might as well just Shanghai the first tech priest we came across. There you go! Prior to everything hitting the fan, Doc had spotted a cogboy bossing around a bunch of servitors a few days back towards mm -hmm. the rear of the ship. Then he remembered that the tech priest had been doing something vaguely repair-like to a large conduit. Okay. This sounded like a good candidate for fixing the warp drive. No. So we lined up behind Doc and went off to see if the techie was still there. We made it to the bay where Doc had seen the tech priest pretty quickly. We'd mapped the whole area earlier, and nothing nearby was damaged. Unfortunately, all we found inside was a horrible smell and a partially opened conduit that was helpfully labeled Dead Felid Inside. Do not open. But the far door was open and so was one in the next room. Oh, God. The cogboy had obviously been in a rush to get somewhere. He'd even cut through some of the thinner bulkheads, and since he seemed to be going towards the area where the warp drive was located, we decided to follow his trail. Okay. We made good time following the path the tech priest had blazed, but the further we traveled, the more uneasy all of us felt. 
which swore that someone was following us. Really? Doc thought he heard other squad members whispering. That's bad. The rest of us were just generally uncomfortable. You're in the warp. It became apparent that we were leaving coverage of the undamaged Gellerfield. <clears throat> From here on out, shit was gonna get spooky. Reality was actually pretty stable where we were, but the minor fluctuations definitely weren't fun. No. Mostly it was a uh, little sounds or flashes of movement at the edges of our vision. And occasionally, one of us would feel a flash of rage or paranoia. It was easy to get distracted, but Sarge kept us focused. Twitch exists in paranoia. Nothing really bad okay. happened until we caught up with the tech priest and his servitors. Cutter was on point, and as he entered a doorway, a servitor lunged at him with a welding torch. Nice. Luckily, he had his chainsword ready and easily parried the blow, then returned the favor. At that point, several more servitors lurched forward, and in a rare burst of sanity, our melee specialist leapt backwards out of the doorway. The second he cleared the line of fire, the rest of us began pouring lace fire into the approaching servitors. These weren't combat servitors, thank the Emperor, but they were still damned hard to kill. Even with the hotshot laser guns Nubby had gotten us, it took a headshot or several joint shots to put each one down. Worse, they definitely didn't have any morale to break. The Horde just kept advancing with glowing eyes and sparking tools. Yeah, that's not a worry at all. We mowed them down without any getting through the door though near the end, one of them cut through the wall and barely missed Twitch. Once we were sure they were all dead, which was remarkably easy since all of their eyes stopped glowing with demonic light when we <laughs> finished them, we advanced into the room. We figured that the puddle with all the clunky bits in it was probably the tech priest we were following. So much for having him repair the warp drive. Yeah, that would generally create It problems. wasn't a total loss, though. The cogboy had booted up a communications console before he died. Yay! And we definitely learned a few things about the state of the ship during our little chase. Mostly that servitors could be possessed or something, and a weak Gellerfield meant slowly going insane. But that was still something. Well, here's the thing. How can they go insane because they already are insane? It's, it's a valid question, you guys. From here on out, we were going to operate on the assumption that all servitors would try to kill us, unless proven otherwise. Twitch suggested we follow the same rule for tech priests, but was vetoed since we'd probably need a few of them alive to get things fixed. The console the former tech priest had warmed up for us was waiting for input, so Sarge decided to call the Cogton and tell him we were heading towards the warp drive to lend assistance. In retrospect, this was a horrible idea. Yeah. None of us had really expected him to be helpful, but we were sort of hoping he'd understand the squad full of well-trained soldiers would be an excellent escort for one of the nearby tech priests. Yeah, you'd think and so. And maybe point us towards them. You'd think so. Instead, we got a burst of binary and a distorted screech telling us not to desecrate his machines and to let the servitors fix the problem. Sarge tried to explain the servitors appeared to be possessed and were not likely to be fixing anything. But all that got was a screech that sounded an awful lot like ignorant meat bags <laughs> and the console locked us out. <sighs> Aquila says... I mean, there's high-functioning insanity, like a certain level of paranoia, aggression, neurotic tics, and then there's chaos insanity. Yeah, that's, that's, that, the distinction is there. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, oh, I just got ran over by a Tonka truck, and oh, I just got hit by a Mack truck. There is a difference. Bloody tech priests. Before this, we'd been operating on the usual assumption that the local leadership was moderately incompetent. Moderately? But after that little tantrum, we decided to upgrade them to pants-on-head retarded. <laughs> this meant that, as far as we were concerned, Sarge had operational command. 
Good. And we weren't even going to try talking to the senior techies anymore. Good. The only way we'd start listening to them again was if they showed up with a lot more firepower than we could muster. Mm -hmm. That decided, we headed towards the warp drive. Aside from the little warpy annoyances, the rest of the trip wasn't so bad. Mostly, it was just a matter of navigating the maze of corridors, reading the helpful notes, and dodging the occasional group of servitors. They all seemed to be headed towards the top of the ship, which was a little odd, but it made them easy to avoid. No, Unfortunately, it's a we worrisome. didn't run into any other tech priests during the walk, so when we finally got to the warp drive, there wasn't much we could do. The drive was obviously in bad shape. About a third of the room had been destroyed by the explosion, That's bad. and there were some pretty big pieces of shrapnel sticking out of the big glowy pillar thing. We couldn't help but notice the lack of servitors fixing things, which pretty much proved our theory about the Cogton's competence or lack thereof. Yep. On the bright side, there weren't any servitors around to try and kill us, yeah, so it was good. easy to set up a perimeter around the drive room. Of course, we still needed to find someone to fix the damn drive. So Sarge ordered Twitch to hold the fort, while the rest of the squad went off to search for a tech priest. We got pretty lucky with that. The fifth room we checked had two of them in it. Well, not really two. More like one and a bit. Well, bits. Oh no. Yeah, lots of bits. Uh. The important thing, though, was that the living tech priest was Jim. Hey, Jimbo! The acolyte was trying to put his boss back together like a very leaky jigsaw puzzle, and didn't seem to be all there. Really? Well, Sergeant Doc knew how to deal with this sort of thing, though, and before long they had Jim up and moving, if still a bit shaken up. Alright, so let's see. Oh, man. Obsidian Blast says, My machines, wait, we already did this joke. Sir Skatari Bush says, No harm doing it twice for good measure. Um, Compton, you shall respect my authority. It's my ship, my technology. If I cannot solve it, then I shall let it burn. He's already done that. As we led him back to the warp drive, he kept insisting that his orders were to clean the incense burners down near Engine 3. Who gives a fuck? Apparently, the Cogton would be furious if he didn't finish before the next maintenance cycle. We tried to explain that fixing the warp drive probably took priority. Yes, it does. But he was very insistent. When logic didn't work, Nubby took a stab. He wheedled, cajoled, and outright lied to the distraught Cogboy. See, we were actually working on the direct orders of the Cogton, and he said it was very important that we fix the warp drive and every tech priest was supposed to help us. In fact, he had specifically said Jim should fix it because he was very impressed with all the techy things that Jim had been doing. Really? Also, no, he shouldn't call the Cogton to make sure. The Cogton <laughs> said he was very busy doing things with machines and servitors and stuff. Yes, very busy. To everyone's surprise, Jim accepted this complete load of horse shit <laughs> and started poking at the damaged drive. Of course, Jim was just a low-level acolyte and knew very little about warp drives. But there were quite a few of the helpful little notes around. Good! He was able to pinpoint several broken components that he knew how to fix, but unfortunately some of those fixes would require rare and expensive parts. Parts that were so rarely replaced that no spares had even been included in the ship's inventory. Yay! Fuck. Now this sounds really bad at first, but after you spend some time in the guard, you learn the difference between what's officially in the inventory and what's available if you're willing to get out a crowbar. <laughs> now B got a full list of parts from the boy and went through each one and quizzed the acolyte about what other ship's systems might use them. Some were pretty much unique to the warp drive, 
but it turned out that most of the really important ones were also used in Geller field generators. Oh, this is fun. We got our map, plotted a route, gave Jim a pistol, and went to make a supply run. The first step of our shopping trip was deciding which Gellerfield generator to plunder. The best candidates for scavenging the parts we needed in one go were the intact generators Why? in the middle of the ship up near the bridge. Unfortunately, those parts were rather critical, and ripping them out would probably break either generator. Mm -hmm. Since those two undamaged generators were probably all that was keeping the ship in reality, we opted to try our luck with one of the damaged ones instead. The one in the rear of the ship was right out. We needed the engines and warp drive to stay demon free. So really, the only option was the generator all the way at the bow of the ship. It was going to be a long walk. Same in an effort crazy. to speed up our journey, we decided to divert to the big spinal freight corridor that ran the length of the ship. As really? we made our way upwards, we reached the ragged edge of the Gellerfield's coverage, and every one of us began to feel reality's grip weakening. No, oh, that's bad. Cutter's sword started talking to him. Doc's teeth began to itch. Nubby could feel his old legs. And when Sarge and Twitch opened a door, they saw a headless corpse and a charred skeleton playing poker. This is bad. Neither of them seemed unfriendly, but we still elected to go around that room. That would be a good idea. When we reached an entrance to the big corridor, Twitch and Jim opened up a small viewport and scouted the place. They closed it very fast. According to them, the corridor was packed with glowy-eyed servitors, and they were all working on something. Twitch also spotted a few minor demons, which seemed to be randomly split between fighting the servitors, helping them, and staying out of their way. None of us knew what to make of that, but it was pretty clear that the main corridor was now possessed servitor territory. We resigned ourselves to a long, slow hike, and headed back down into the ship. Mostly, the trip was boring. The novelty of the ship's horrible design had worn off long ago, and we got used to the minor warp phenomena pretty quickly. Seen one room with faulty gravity or walls that wept blood, seen them all. It was nice when we got into the coverage of the fully functional Gellerfield. Yay. We actually stopped and took a lunch break at our old base in the generator room. While we ate, Twitch checked his traps and reported that no one had messed with them. Jim walked us through identifying the parts he'd need from the sacrificial generator. I'll remember the poker room. Once we were through the fully covered region, things started to get dangerous again. We ran across a few bands of servitors that seemed to be searching the ship for something, as well as the occasional minor demon. Yay! None of us saw any profit in slugging it out, so we all did our best to stay quiet and avoid the hostiles. <laughs> Thanks to Twitch and Nubby's scouting abilities, Ronnie says this is like going through Strider's mind. <laughs> we mostly succeeded, and the single pack of servitors and handful of demons we couldn't go around were easy kills. As we got closer to the Gellerfield generator, we heard fighting and picked up the pace. The source of the noise turned out to be a group of servitors trying to get into the generator room, which someone inside was vigorously defending. Okay. Who's we figured that some of the tech priests were holed up in there and hit the servitors in the rear. It was a clean fight, and once Cutter had finished off the last one, we cautiously made our way into the room. Surprisingly, it was not filled with tech priests. Instead, it contained a mob of pale old men. They were armed with what looked like modified power tools, and each of them had a few yellow notepads sticking out of their pockets. Wait, what? While it was a bit of a surprise to run into a bunch of stowaways, we'd sort of expected something like this. When the notes kept- You know what, that's- the, the sheer fact that these people are on there is like the least concerning thing so far that's happened on this ship. 
kept appearing, we knew it was either some incredibly helpful person, or some sort of warp trickery or machine spirit weirdness. All of us had been fervently hoping for the helpful person explanation, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. We hadn't been prepared for just how old they were, though. These guys looked like they were all over a hundred. The beardiest of the stowaways greeted us all by name, the beardiest. which was a little creepy. That is creepy. Introduced himself as Old Bill, Bill, and thanked us for the help. He. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, "My man, Bill." It's good to know that Bill doesn't suck. Was apparently the Thank leader you, of a group of crew members it, who bud. hadn't been willing to leave the ship. They'd outlived three captains already and they'd be damned if they wouldn't outlive a fourth. Huh. Sarge processed this, then decided to skip all the bullshit about mysteries, notes, secret passages, and all that in favor of actually getting shit done. He explained the situation with the warp drive, our plan to rip the generator they'd all been defending apart, and then asked the old men what it would take to get their support. The old geezers weren't keen on scrapping the generator, but when Jim explained the damage to the warp drive, they agreed that it was necessary. Yes. The problem was that the old geezers weren't the only stowaways on the ship. They'd had a bunch of friends and even some family living in Hydroponics Bay 7C, and when the Geller Field collapsed, those folks would be ass-deep in demons. That's... The old men would throw in with us if we went and evacuated everyone to a safer part of the ship. If there's anybody still alive there, that's going to be shocking. Here we go. And also, just while we were in the area, got rid of the small army of servitors laying siege to the hydroponics bay. Yes! All in all, this was a pretty good deal. Jim was going to need some time and help getting the parts ready to be pulled out. Ronnie has the comment of the stream so far. So Nubby bought half a ship with stowaways, broken Geller fields, and, and a bad engine, and it only got half off. Nubby got screwed. Not, Nubby got scammed. I'm still waiting to hear how he got this great price he was talking about. And we didn't have anything better to do. Before we went anywhere, though, we had a few things to take care of. While Twitch pulled out a few of his toys and beefed the generator room's defenses, Beef. the rest of us went to find Hannah, who was supposedly in one of the nearby damaged rooms. Mm -hmm. We found the poor cog girl trapped behind some rubble. And with the help of a lace cutter we pried off one of the servitors, we got her out of there. Yay. Hannah wasn't very happy. In fact, she was practically hysterical. Hmm but she was relatively unscathed. None of us were well-equipped to handle a panicking cog girl, so Doc gave her a few band-aids and we unceremoniously dumped her on Jim and the old guys. There you go. Our heroic rescue mission successful, we gathered up Twitch and went to get the rest of the stowaways out of their hydroponics bay. The directions that Bill <coughs> gave us were great, and we quickly reached the bay's access corridor. Yay! He hadn't been exaggerating about the small army of servitors, though. In fact, it was more of a medium army now. And there were a few demons in there, too. They seemed keen on something inside the bay, but weren't making much headway against the big-ass doors. That was a good thing, because we definitely couldn't handle all those servitors with our current loadout. See, at this point, I would really like... I would really like it if Crispy was still alive, because he'd be going to town with a flander on this place. We needed to make a plan. <coughs> we debated the problem for a while. Twitch was in favor of setting a large explosive trap. Doc thought there might be another way into the bay. Sarge explained to Nubby that we couldn't just tell the old guys that they were dead when we got there. And Cutter <laughs> was talking to his sword again. Nice! Cutter's Eventually, mind. we decided to go with Doc's suggestion and started scouting the surrounding area. That's how we found Hydroponics Bay 9D. 9D. The bay that the stowaways lived in had some big warnings painted on the door. Okay. Stuff like, 
Do not enter. Use console to request rations. Hazardous materials and incredibly dangerous never open. 9D's doors just had three meter high letters that said, Beware of Narlock. Of course, we didn't believe that for a second. Oh, God. There was absolutely no reason for there to be a Narlock on an Imperial vessel. Look, you're on it this ship. There's every reason. Absolutely just a ruse to keep people out. This meant it was probably another entrance to the stowaways bay. With any luck, we could cut through there and get everyone out without the servitors noticing. About oh, 30 Christ. seconds after we jimmied open the big cargo doors, we slammed them shut again, because holy shit, that Narlock looked pissed. <laughs> we decided to take a little breather after that scare and reconsider our options. Mm. Thank you, Hobbit. Cutter, Cut, Hobbit says, Cutter is finally able to talk to his best friend, his chainsword. Yes, he is. Yes. Narlock, okay, so Sir, if you guys didn't know, Sir Skatari Bush says, a Narlock is a crude dinosaur. Shit. Fucking towel. The bad news was that Thank we you, definitely Hobbit. weren't sneaking through that hydroponics bay. No. But on the other hand, we had an amazing distraction available to us. Mm -hmm. All we had to do was get it out of the bay and down one level. Then it would keep the servitors busy while we snuck in. A little tinkering with the door controls and a nearby lift, a few dead servitors, and we were ready to rock. It worked like a charm. The Narlock barreled out of the bay the second the doors were open and nice. ran right into a pile of servitor corpses sitting on the elevator. Yay! We activated the lift and watched with delight as the entire army of servitors turned to face the new threat. Yay! As much as we wanted to stay around and watch the fight, we had stuff to do. The second the last servitors left the room, we dashed over to the bay's comm panels and nicely asked them to open up. I'm not sure what we expected to find in there, but it definitely wasn't a flourishing tribal village in the middle of a small jungle. Huh? Seriously, okay. it was an entire village. Grass huts and everything. Okay. There must have been over 200 of them in there. Just hanging out and living a relatively simple agricultural life in the middle of a bloody spaceship. Okay. We'd seen weirder things. Hell, we just started a fight between... I'm not even questioning this right now. That's how... I'm, I'm just used to it at this point. A spacefaring dinosaur and a bunch of possessed mechanical corpses. This is true. But this was definitely one of those special memories that would stay with us. It was remarkably easy to get them evacuated. This wasn't the first time they'd migrated to a new home. And old Bill had called ahead to make sure they knew the score. They gathered up most of their village into packs and cargo trolleys, and then we all got the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. As we walked, the sounds of battle echoed in the distance, along with the occasional roar. We congratulated ourselves on our brilliant planning, and assured each other that there was no way this was going to come back and bite us in the ass. It's going to come back and bite him in the ass. We led the migration back to the generator room without serious incident. The tribals seemed pretty tough, and between us and their warriors, we easily managed to kill the few demons and servitors we ran into. Mm -hmm. Once we arrived, Bill detailed a few of his men to lead them to a safer area, then invited us in to look at the preparations for pulling out the parts. What's actually shocking to me is all those people survived. We'd expected everything to be more or less ready. They had all the tools and knowledge of the ship, after all. It should have just been a matter of us saying it was time to go. Then they'd pull everything out and that'd be that. Instead, they gave us a bewildering briefing about what to cut, what to grab, how to carry it, and where to go. Then they left. They didn't offer to help or check if we agreed with their plan. Oh, Hell! 
They didn't even ask if we understood everything. Oh, that's They wonderful. just bossed us around, wished us luck, then left. In the words of that ancient guardsman hero, Alanius Pius, why the hell is everything always our job? <laughs> we didn't spend too long wallowing in self-pity, though. You get used to this sort of thing when you're a guardsman. Mm-hmm. Sergeant Doc pulled their heads together and formed a plan. Nubby and Cutter went over the instructions we'd all been given, and Twitch cleared up his traps. Jim had marked out what needed to be cut, what needed to be grabbed, and what order to do it in. All we had to do was run to safety, and we were damned good at that. There you go. It would all be relatively simple, except for the fact that the Geller field would be collapsing around us. Doc and Sarge put a lot of thought into who would be carrying what. Nubby was the fastest one of us, thanks to his augmatic legs, so he'd grab the last parts. The thief is the Sergeant fastest, Sergeant Cutter were the sense. strongest and would handle the heavy parts. Finally, Twitch and Doc would keep their weapons free to cover the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Each of us memorized our role on the plan, reviewed the map and directions Bill gave us, and got ready to run like the demons of the warp were pursuing us, because they probably would be. Yeah, they will be. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, on this ship, lesser demons become target practice. Anytime you can make that statement accurately, you're in a fucked situation. And they are, like, this is just an amazingly fucked situation. There is a lot of comments right now in the chat talking about how they need butt protection. Mm-hmm. Ronnie says, the tech priest shamed the Omnissiah even more than my misspelling does with letting guardsmen fix the engines. No shit. Thank you, Slacker. I appreciate it, bud. Sarge called Jim and Bill, made sure everyone was clear, and counted down. We worked fast, ripping out part after part as cables sparked and alarms blared all around us. This is good. The second the final piece was out, we barreled out of the now smoke-filled room and ran like hell. Good idea. We got about 50 meters before we felt the Geller field start to fail, and reality went runny around the edges. Yay. The whispers, flashes of movement, and sudden emotions hit us first. Doc and Twitch fired at several shadows, only one of which had an actual demon in it. Sarge started screaming at Nubby and vowed to beat the little trooper to death with his own augmatic legs, <laughs> and Cutter began apologizing to his sword for not using her enough. We managed to keep together and keep moving, though, even if Nubby had to take the lead since Sarge was pretty much chasing him now. <laughs> the gravity fluctuations and bleeding walls came next along with a mm -hmm. few more minor arcane horrors that just sort of blinked at us as we barreled past. Twice we got slammed off our feet when down changed to left or right, but we'd taken those extra few seconds to tie down the parts and didn't lose anything. We did get damned messy. Luckily, warp blood washes out just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Our first serious demon encounter came at about the halfway mark. Nubby came backpedaling out a room screaming about eyes and tentacles, and we just barely managed to stop and shut the door in time. Yay, good. We tried to divert around, but both of the side passages seemed to open into the same place. A room which appeared to be several kilometers across and filled with fire. Oh. There wasn't time for this shit, so no. we popped up in the hatch, <laughs> chucked in four grenades and one of Twitch's debt packs, and slammed it again. The second the bang went off, we opened it up and just sprinted across the room while doing our best to ignore the writhing tentacles. Yay! We got a few rooms past that without incident, then found ourselves in some sort of infinite loop of corridors. After the third time, we passed a door labeled Temporary Sewage Storage, where a suit, we realized what was happening and stopped to figure things out. Behind us, a door banged open, and a mass of tentacles started pouring out. I've watched enough hentai to know where this is going. Cutter leapt into action and started hacking off limbs, while the rest of us started wildly opening doors. 
The first one had what looked like the hospitalier and that bitch of an interrogator tied up and screaming for help inside. Run. Sarge slammed it shut before anyone else could move. The second and third were filled with more tentacles and fire, respectively. Yes. But we got them closed before anything bad happened. The next one had that headless corpse and charred skeleton playing poker again. Hey! Now that we saw it a second time, the corpse wasn't quite headless. He just had a bad case of exit wound face. Mm-hmm. When we opened the door, he... Is that heavy and crispy? He casually waved at us. It's and heavy and crispy! Rested what was left of his head on the table while his partner turned to face us. The well done skeleton laughed and told us we probably wanted the door across the hall that was labeled light cargo only. Oh. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says it's the poker room of the damned. Yes. Yes, where the pot is more than the payout. Oh god, is that is that heavy and crispy? From his resting spot on the table, the nearly headless corpse gurgled something which prompted the skeleton to laugh again and warned us not to open the poo door. Doc awkwardly thanked him and slammed the hatch shut. After a brief debate, we took- the Look, I will call him crispy. I will call him crispy all day long. Thank you, slacker. I will call him crispy all day long. I love the guy. Aquila, thank you. Some, sometimes you just have to play poker with your mates. That's true. That is true. But you're playing poker in the warp, and that's that's disturbing. Oh, no. The Jolly Skeleton's advice. Thank you, Aquila. He seems pretty trustworthy. And... Oh. Nick. Nick is there. Yeah. I was thinking the Arbides might be in there. Nick says and the Ar Arbides, but um, the the one with the exit wound. There's, yeah, yeah, the Arbides definitely. And piled through the marked door. A second later, we piled back out. Thank you, Quilla. Cool. Thank you, Nick. Him after us. There weren't any side passages in the next two rooms. And when we barreled through the last door, we found ourselves back in familiar territory near the edge of the safe zone. As we ran, reality finally started to get its shit back together, and the going got significantly easier. Yay! We started picking up speed, only stopping to pop a few minor demons and divert around a pit that opened up into the huge fiery room again. Then, right as we started running down the last hallway... A large sword slammed through a door, and Cutter immediately abandoned his cart in favor of having a sword fight with a demon. Go figure. You could say that it was an act of heroic bravery or selfless sacrifice, but you'd be wrong. It was an act of complete and utter retardation, <laughs> and only Sarge grabbing him by the legs while everyone else gave covering fire saved his stupid life. Cutter is literally Sir Lancelot from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. The demon followed, of course, but hot shots pack a punch, and we kept him back long enough for Twitch to drop a few mines. The second they were down, we ran like little girls and just barely got around a corner before that demon went bang. We didn't go back to check if it was dead. As long as it wasn't following us, we were happy. Yeah. Cutter had gotten a pretty mean chest wound before Sarge yanked him away, and wasn't looking too hot as we dumped him onto one of the carts. Once the squad was fully inside the safe zone, we stopped in a handy room, and Doc got to work on him. Good. While he did the stitching and stuff, Sarge called the Acolytes and had them send someone to take the loot the rest of the way. Once Cutter was sorted out, we all hiked down to the warp drive. The trip was a lot quieter this time around. The techies or the old crewmen must have beefed up the rear Geller field, and we saw a few of the tribal warriors standing guard at junctions. Hmm. When we reached the drive room, the place was a hive of activity. Jim and Hannah were running around fixing things, 
The stowaways were acting as assistants and advisors, and old Bill was yelling directions at everyone. Good old the Bill. second he saw us, old Bill waved us over and filled us in. Repairs were going well, the perimeter was holding up fine, and it wouldn't be long until we could shift back into real space. Yay! We all breathed a sigh of relief. But before anyone could celebrate, Hannah poked her head out of a gutted machine and reported that some piece of warpy tech was busted. Everyone went quiet at this. Old Bill thought hard for a few seconds, then brightened up and told everyone not to worry. There was a spare aboard. The old bugger turned to us, gave a toothless smile, and said he needed a few brave lads to fetch a part from the Psyker holding cells downstairs. Mm. As one, we turned to Nubby, who started to sidle out of the room. You see, with the exception of Cutter, all of us had a bit of experience with Psykers and ships with Psyker holding cells. We'd been part of a team which had busted up a corrupt government group that was gathering up all of a planet's nascent psychers, usually as children, and selling them off world. Mm. That mission had ended with us being sent home with a scathing report, which we then doctored to make us look better. Last we'd heard, the jackass who was running the investigation was still looking for the rest of the ships which had been used to transport the kidnapped psychers. Up to this point, we'd put Nubby's position as the ship's procurer down to bureaucratic incompetence or a completely understandable desire to get him out from underfoot. From there, it was easy to blame the horrible quality of the ship on Nubby's unique Weasley incompetence as well as some of the ordinary variety from his bosses. All that went out the window the second we heard the phrase Psyker holding cells, though, and we jumped to some new conclusions. As we walked, Sarge grilled the despicable little trooper, and the truth finally came out. He'd spotted this ship in some report or other, and instead of turning it in and having it seized, the cretin had decided to try and impress his boss. Nubby had flagged the ship as a prospective purchase, and then went and swore up and down to his superior that he could get it at a much lower price than anyone else. Emperor only knows why his boss agreed. Airlock that son of a bitch. Airlock him now. Just no. Nothing. There's nothing left. There's nothing fucking left. Oh my god. Why? Psyker holding. Oh no. Oh no. Oh. Thank you, Slacker. Psyker holding cells. Airlock Nubby after leaving the warp. Why fucking wait, Slacker? Why wait? Airlock him now. Like, tie a ribbon around his head and shove him into the areas that aren't affected by the Geller Fields. Oh my god. What the hell? Why? Oh, Possibly the poor god. man had just wanted Nubby to go away for a few months. Right up to that final meeting with the fat cat. The only thing that makes this worse is that is if that bitch of an interrogator is here. If that bitch of an interrogator is here, that's going to be... That, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Captain, the purchasing process had gone normally. Then Nubby, in his infinite brilliance, had told the man that he knew the ship's dirty secret and threatened to expose him if he didn't bring down the price. Oh! Yep. <clears throat> like... Oh, 
Thank you, Hobbit. If Nubby is airlocked, who gets them ammo booms? Anyone else but Nubby at this point, because good God! It wasn't hard to see why bombs had been planted on the ship. No shit. Or who had planted them. No shit. Damn Nubby and his bloody stupid schemes. The worst part was how he tried to defend himself. Please. Pointing out that he didn't lie to nobody about nothing. And specifically said we weren't quisitors. And there weren't no hard feelings and it was just business. And got a really good deal. Even with all the dents and stuff. Nubby. We were Why? all just about ready to kill him. Yes. And Sarge probably would have if we didn't have any other concerns at the moment. Instead, we privately vowed that Nubby would never again be allowed any sort of authority. And if we survived this, everything would be blamed on him. Mm-hmm. The only way he can make this worse is in some way that interrogator that he's in love with is on this ship. Our trip started to get hairy as we descended deeper into the ship. Really? The cells were way at the edge of the current Gellerfield coverage. Aside from the usual weirdness and the fair number of minor demons, which we killed if we couldn't avoid them, we ran into a few more of those spooky doors that opened into weird places. We got that huge fire room five times. Yeah. The Tentacle Demon twice, Yay. and found one room inhabited by some sort of sewage monster. The last one might have been real, though. The note on the door did say, Xenos Waste Processing Device. Do not enter. The last warpy door we ran into had the rather crispy skeleton playing poker again. Rather crispy skeleton, yes. But now the headshot man was slumped in the armchair in the corner and a bunch of other players had taken his place. Okay. We spotted a bunch of ghostly-looking soldiers with regimental insignias we couldn't quite make out. Your old regiment? And some vague specters who looked eerily familiar. There was also a big guy with a sword drowning someone wearing robes in the punch bowl. A big guy with a sword drowning someone wearing robes. The cleric getting drowned. Yeah. <laughs> He's getting drowned by the Cornite. <laughs> Thank you, Slacker. Slacker asked me, do you still like Nubby? Fuck no. Nubby's a fucking idiot. Jesus. Ugh. As we tried to quietly... That's the Cornite drowning the cleric, guys. I bet you anything. ...shut the door, the skeleton spotted us and congratulated us on staying alive. The nearly headless one jerked up in his chair and gurgled something, then mm -hmm. slumped back down. The burnt skeleton practically fell over laughing at this, but he caught his breath right before we slammed the door. As the hatch closed, he advised us to check the cells before we took our part. A second later, after we'd slowly backed away from the door, it popped back open, and we heard the skeleton shout that the big guy had no hard feelings not to open the last cell. It's the Cornite. On that cryptic note, the door slammed shut again. We spent a few seconds digesting the skeleton's advice, and how oddly familiar the room's occupants had been. It's crispy! Twitch suggested opening it up for another look, but Sarge vetoed this and led us down the last corridor to the Psyker cells. The Psyker holding cells were much, much fancier than anything we'd seen on the occurrence border. It was a fairly small place, with only a dozen actual cells. But they'd obviously been custom-built and installed instead of scavenged. It had probably been part of the contract for hauling the psychers. The part we needed was sticking out of some arcane machine in the middle of the main room. Right where old Bill said it would be. We cut open the casing... Okay. loosened the part, and mm -hmm. left it in place while we checked what was inside the cells. The skeleton and his macabre buddies hadn't steered us wrong yet. We all got into covering positions around one of the doors. Doc opened it, 
peeked inside and started swearing when he saw the occupant. The kid didn't look more than eight years old, oh, come though on. who knew how long he'd been laying in that stasis field. And there was a little card at the foot of his bed which had Greek letters and a list of specialties. This one was apparently a pyromancer and a telekine. We checked the rest of the cells, except the one we'd been warned about, and found about half of them occupied. Mm -hmm. We had five psychers between the ages of five and ten sitting in stasis, and chances were the only thing keeping them from being possessed by big-ass demons mm -hmm. was the part we were about to take. The smart option at this point would have been to just kill them. Yes. We couldn't take their stasis beds with us, and we were in the middle of a freaking incursion here. Mm -hmm. This was just about the worst place and time to have a bunch of untrained psychers running around. Yes. In the end, though, none of us were big enough bastards to do it. One by one, we pulled them out of their beds then. Since we weren't complete idiots, we tranked them and stuffed them into our backpacks. They didn't weigh much more than a full field kit. For the second time that day, we planned our path, yanked out a piece of delicate machinery, and ran like hell. We didn't have to contend with nearly as much warp bullshit this time. Yay. But the second we pulled out that part, the one unopened door was dented outwards, and we heard demonic howling from every direction. This is bad. We ran as fast as we could and kept our weapons ready. The first few were the minor demons we'd been seeing somewhere, and it only took a single shot to put them down. The problem was that every one cost us a second, and something was slamming up the corridors behind us. Yeah. It did not sound friendly, but we were doing a pretty good job of keeping ahead of it at first. It wasn't until... <laughs> The, the, this the, this one's just getting me depressed. It really is. I'm glad they didn't kill the kids. So we ran into the that's larger like the only thing that's that happening. whatever was chasing us began to gain ground. That damn tentacle demon was the first one we ran into. It burst through a door as we were running past. Oh, yay! And made a grab for Doc's kid. He dodged just in time and Cutter managed to hold the thing off long enough for the rest of us to get past. For once, we didn't need to pull the nutcase away from the fight. The second we were clear, he started falling back. Twitch tossed a few hot nades into the mess of tentacles, which kept it back long enough for us to slam a door shut and continued our run. Mm -hmm. A short time later, we heard some especially loud demonic shrieks, a few clangs, and the sound of a shut door being torn open. That's bad. After that, it was clear running for a while. There were a few small fry, another door with the two disguised demonettes, which we slammed shut. Nubby was nearly set on fire when his kid manifested a few small fireballs in his sleep. No. But it was basically easy going. We were getting tired, though, and whatever was... You know what? That was Nubby. Let him burn. He needs to burn. Behind us was gaining. We started shutting every door we went through, and Twitch began dropping mines. But as far as we could tell, that only made it matter. Eventually, it became clear that the strengthening Geller field wasn't going to stop our pursuit. Mm -hmm. So as we ran, we got ready for a fight. The moment we ran into one of the small groups of tribal warriors, we practically threw the kids on them and slammed the door we'd come through. We piled the last of Twitch's debt packs, plus every grenade we had, around the door. Then we got into firing positions. Half a minute later, the hatch burst open and a demon host flew through. Yay! We thought it looked like a little kid with big black wings made out of smoke. But none of us got a long enough look before the explosives went off. Corvus? The second the shockwave was passed, Every one of us began pouring full-auto fire down the smoke-filled corridor. 
After a half minute of continuous firing, our view began to clear and we all heard a voice in our heads vowing vengeance as soon as it found a more suitable host. No. At Sarge's order, we stayed in position for a few minutes, in case it was a trick, but the demon host didn't reappear. Eventually, we declared victory and headed up to the warp drive to see how things were going. Some tribal women were caring for the kids when we got there. Uh, hey, thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, hi, Frank. Who's Frank? I, I, I remember Frank from something in the story, and I just can't remember off the top of my head. Which one is Frank? Somebody refresh my memory, because now I'm feeling like an idiot. Thank you, Slacker. I appreciate it, bud. Doc ran over and made sure no one tried to wake them up, while the rest of us resupplied and talked to old Bill and the Acolytes. Mm -hmm. They were overjoyed to see the part we got for them, Frank and the immediately demon. started welding it in place. While they worked, Bill explained that everything was pretty much ready, and all that was left to do was call up to the bridge and get whoever was piloting this thing to take us out of warp. Nobody's piloting. All of us groaned at that. We knew this meant talking to the Cogton, yes. and weren't looking forward to the conversation. Hopefully, he'd just accept that we'd all saved his bacon and hit the damned button instead of yelling about stuff. He will yell. Hannah went over and tinkered with the room's comm console, and Sarge got ready to do the talking. We'd been expecting a little shouting or something. Instead, all we got was a deranged voice screeching about weak flesh and avatar of the Omnisaya, and the console caught fire. The this consensus was that the Cogton had completely lost it, so someone had to go upstairs and hit the buttons on the bridge. Of course, everyone looked at us as they said that. Of course they did. It just wasn't surprising anymore. At least we managed to convince them that we needed a short break before we ran into another fight. Yeah. All of us grabbed a snack and tried to catch a few minutes of sleep. While we rested, one of Bill's men went and fetched the really heavy ordnance that we had left in our quarters. We figured that we'd need every bit of firepower we could get for this trip, because the only way to access the command deck was through the main lifts located in the big spinal corridor the one full of possessed servitors. <laughs> At least we'd be crossing it where there was good Gellerfield coverage. When our heavy weapons arrived, we staggered to our feet and got ready for one last hike. Twitch had all of his explosives, Sarge had his grenade launcher, Nubby had a few single-shot rockets, and Doc and Cutter had as much ammo as they could carry. There was no way we'd cross that corridor without being noticed, so we might as well be ready to kill whatever we ran into. We made sure we had a clean comm connection to the Acolytes and clanked our way up towards the big spinal corridor. We planned our route so we'd spend the minimal amount of time in there before we got to the lifts, and prayed to the Emperor that most of the servitors would be busy somewhere else. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Really? As we reached the edge of the safe zone, a pair of tribal scouts reported that the servitors were building something almost right on top of the lifts. Why am I worried? What we saw when we peeked into the big hallway was pretty damn terrifying. The servitors were piling all sorts of materials, including themselves, into some sort of giant structure. A ring of what looked like every surviving tech priest was standing around the structure, giving commands to the servitors and chanting in binary. Up above all this activity, there was a hovering platform, and standing right in the middle of it, Screaming like a cross between a shorted Vox unit and a mechanical sprinkler was the Cogton. Also, everything was glowing, which was probably bad. Very. 
We didn't wait to see what was happening, or bother to try to find a way to sneak around. We just hefted our weapons and started pouring as much fire as possible <laughs> into both the glowing structure and the tech priests. Meat and metal flew everywhere. Our first volley tore apart dozens of servitors and cogboys, but to our surprise, they didn't react at all. They just ignored us while they kept chanting and building. That's we a didn't big problem. stop to ponder this. If they were going to hold still and be easy targets, we were going to take advantage of it. Unf like, seriously, this is a problem. Th th this is a big problem. Fortunately, this happy state didn't last for long. Before we could kill more than half the tech priests, the chanting rose to a crescendo, and the surviving cogboys climbed onto the structure with the last of the servitors. The Cogton stepped off his platform onto the top of the thing, and with a slow, smooth movement, the whole damn pile stood up. It was like they built a fucking Gundam, some sort of servitor titan, and boy was it pissed. We poured the rest of our launcher rounds and missiles into the damn thing without much effect. A few servitors dropped off, but the others sort of flowed into the holes and things just kept coming. That's disgusting. As it approached, the Cogden kept up his screaming and added the occasional gothic insult. We decided it was time to get the hell out of there and turn towards the door we came through. Right as we got to it, there was an especially loud screech from behind us, and the door slammed shut. Then, the door on the other side of the corridor slammed shut. Finally, with a tremendous crashing sound, every door down the length of the corridor shut itself. No! We took a look at the doors, then at the Serva Titan, briefly pondered the situation, the and Titan. started running down the corridor like scared little girls. Behind us, the monstrosity... This is dumber than the Servitors. ...lengthened its gait and started picking up speed. As we ran, we dodged past a few remaining servitors and minor demons who wandered towards the Titan. We didn't stop to worry about them, but when we looked back, the monstrosity was stopping to pick them up and slap them into its body. Ooh. That was probably a bad thing, but at least it was slowing the monster down. We started to gain a lead on the Serva Titan and began considering options. We were down to shooting it a lot and hoping it had a weak point piling all our explosives together and hoping it was enough, or blasting open a door. Sarge decided to go with the big pile of mines. There you go. But just as we were getting ready to stop and set it up, we saw something ahead of us. Something about as large as the Serva Titan was coming down the corridor. Upon closer inspection, it appeared to be some sort of large, bipedal lizard with wings, black, smoky wings, also horns, and very glowy eyes. So no shit, there we were. Thank you, finally, Captain. finally, I needed this line the whole damn time, so no shit, there we were. In a hallway with a horrible servitor titan coming at us from uh -huh. one side, and a possessed narlock coming from the other. This is great! There were probably worse positions to be in, but damned if we could think of any at the moment. Not really. Suddenly, blasting open a door looked like the best available option. We all unhelpfully yelled at Twitch as he picked out a small door and set the minimum number of charges needed. <laughs> Narlock has evolved. To open it up. Both the demonic horrors were closing on us, as we took cover and hit the detonator. Uh, Warden asks, on a scale of one to Vrax, how bad would you rate the situation? I'd rate it at about a .8 Vrax. It was all we could do to stay in cover until the explosives went off. The second the door was open, we piled through and got as far away from it as possible. Behind us, there was a loud crash 
and a good portion of the bulkhead around the door bent inward. A second later... I just, all I need right now is that Japanese guy from Godzilla. Let them fight. There was a meteor-sounding crash, and a tremendous amount of screeching and roaring. We all watched the doorway as huge feet stomped back and forth, Yay. and the noise continued. From the look of things, the two monsters had gotten into a bit of a fight. The kaiju were fighting. For the time being, we'd been forgotten. We had absolutely... It's like Pacific Rim. In space! No desire to interrupt that fight. It was the only distraction we were likely to get, and hopefully one of them would kill the other. We ran along side rooms and passages as quickly as we could, and got as far towards the lifts as possible before we blew open another door. As soon as it was open... We started running down the corridor as fast as our legs could carry us. Good idea. Every once in a while, we'd look back to make sure the giants were still fighting and hadn't noticed us. Amazingly, our luck held out, and we reached the elevators without incident. We piled onto the single large platform that would take us up to the bridge, hit the button, and breathed a sigh of relief as the fight dropped out of sight. And that side of relief is going to last 20 seconds. In an offhand seconds. way, Twitch wondered if the fight would end with them combining into a demonic Servinarla Titan. No one laughed. Considering how things are going, I would As wouldn't. we rode up, Sarge calmed Jim and the rest to make sure everything was still okay mm. and fill them in on the situation. The Acolytes took the news about the Cogton a little hard, but otherwise everything down there was just fine. All we had to do was hit a few buttons and we'd be out of the warp. Down below us there was a titanic crash and a scream that shook the walls. Nubby pushed the up button a few more times and Twitch <laughs> started getting the rest of his explosives ready. When we reached the top of the elevator, Twitch fixed his debt packs to platform's joints, and we all headed through a pair of impressive-looking doors. The bridge was large, filled with blinking lights, had a massive but slightly cracked window that was currently covered, and was practically papered with little yellow notes. As we stood and pondered the massive array of buttons, there was another scream, and the elevator started to descend. That focused our attention nicely. Yes, it typically we would. We started hunting through the arrays of controls for the warp drive switch. Bill said it was large, blue, labeled Fire Missile Bay 26F, and had a note that said never, ever, ever touch. Yes. This, the Narlock is now Mecha Streisand, people. It is now Mecha Streisand. Oh my god, this is horrifying. That last part was completely useless. Almost every note on the bridge said that, and we wondered how the Cogton had steered this thing. Maybe he just jammed his tentacle into it or something. That wouldn't surprise me. It took a fair bit of painful trial and error to find the right switch. Mm. Every time one of us found one that looked good, we hit it and hoped for the best. Before we got the right one, we managed to find the controls for three cargo bays, a positioning engine, and the gravity for the top third of the ship. The last one nearly killed us, but Doc managed to hold on to it and get it back to normal before anyone got badly hurt. When we finally found the right switch, we flipped it down and waited for something to happen. There was a charging sound, an incredibly loud clang, and Jim helpfully informed us that a major demonic presence was keeping us from dewarping. Really? It didn't take us long to guess what was going on, and we all ran to the elevator shaft and looked down. Mm-hmm. Twitch started giggling as the demonic servo Narla Titan slowly rose towards it's us. It's Mecha Streisand. The thing looked pretty mean. Well, actually, it looked pretty much the same as it had before, except with a narlock head for an arm and an undersized set of smoky wings. 
Still, that was way more than we wanted to fight. Sarge gave Twitch a poke, and the trooper hit all of his detonators. Thank you. The platform disintegrated, along with the bottom half of the monstrosity. Thank you. But as we all watched in horror, the thing sank its teeth and claws into the side of the shaft oh, and began to climb. Oh, come on. Come this on. This was not a good thing. Ugh. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, we've hit double Vrax. <laughs> we've hit double Vrax at this point. Uh, Adrian says, you can't escape the boss fight. The DM worked hard for that fight. Uh, I don't know how to say your name. Dragon? Dark Dragon. Dark Dragon Steel. Yes. 82MPN says, this is why we push B if the Narlock evolves. <laughs> we had no desire to fight this horror in close combat. We got out our laser guns and grenades, and every one of us poured as much fire as possible into the thing's hands. The monstrosity made it about three quarters of the way up Thank to you, us Slager. before, all at once, its normaler hand disintegrated. Oh, thank the God. The thing managed to hang on with its dino arm for a moment. The thing is possessed by the spirit of Alex Jones. Then plummeted down into the depths. A few seconds later, there was an impressive squishing sound. Nice. Then the universe went prolg and tasted faintly of the color yellow. Oh. We all turned and watched as the large shutters on the bridge front window started to open. Ah, oh, yay. The occurrence border had achieved reality. Yay. As we congrat- But no Sam Rhymes. That, that, that each other sad. on a job well done and wandered back towards the bridge there was an ominous swooping sound behind us all of us turned to face the shaft and watched as the cogton rose out of it complete with smoky black wings and curly metal horns yay no one moved not us and not the demonic tech priest Everyone just stood there and calculated the odds. <laughs> then Cutter revved his chainsword. Of course. The Cogton let out a horrible screeching laugh and hefted his gear shaft. And both of them lunged forwards. Of course Cutter would be like, Each let's of us go. sprang into action like the pros we were. Pros. A torrent of laze fire plowed into the demon host. How many boss fights has there been in this? and Cutter neatly intercepted his charge. He met the Cogton's staff with his chainsword, forcing the stroke aside, and then dodged away so we could get another volley in. Yes. We repeated this trick three times before the demon host let out a scream of frustration and leveled his staff at Doc. Leave Doc alone. The bolt of black lightning hit the medic in the chest and threw him into a wall. Oh, come but on, leave Doc alone. Before the could follow up his attack, Cutter brought his chainsword down and removed one of the bastard's metal arms. Good job, Cutter. Uh, Hobbit says yellow equals gold equals the Emperor protects. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Thank you, Hobbit. Um, Sir Skatari Bush says yellow is an opposite of purple. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, he didn't manage to dodge the Cogden's counterstroke and was thrown nearly to the edge of the shaft. With Cutter out of the line of fire, the rest of us poured as much lace fire as we could into the demon host and actually started to force the foul thing back. He countered with a few more lightning bolts, but two missed their mark and the last one only fried one of Nubby's legs. Yeah. We managed to push the Cogton all the way to the ledge of the shaft where he crouched and put up some sort of shield. Behind him, Cutter... He just turned to he just turned into a droid from Star Wars. He literally just turned into to one of the attack droids from Star Wars. What was it, Droidicus? Cutter silently got to his feet and raised his sword. Cutter didn't manage the decapitation he was aiming for, but he got one of the smoky wings and knocked the Cogton off balance. Hmm. A few shots from the rest of the squad pushed him a little further and the demon host slowly began to topple into the shaft. At the very last second, his remaining hand reached out, grabbed Cutter's ankle, no. and pulled it out from under him. No. 
Cutter just barely managed to grab the edge of the shaft with both hands and kick off the Cogton's grip. Thank the you. The demon host started to erratically fall down the shaft, flapping his remaining wing and screaming curses in a horrible mix of demonic and binary. In other words, the sound of the internet connecting back in the 90s. Cutter didn't spare any attention for the falling Cogton. He was fixated on something much more important. Next to him, just barely out of reach, his chainsword was teetering from the lip of the shaft. Not as... No! He watched in horror as, ever so slowly, it tipped over. Sarge... I'm hearing Celine Dion songs right now. <laughs> My heart will go on when that thing falls off. That's sad. Saw what was coming next and almost managed to get him out of there in time. Almost being the key word. The damned fool let go of the edge and oh, swung God. himself towards his beloved chainsword. The non-com watched as Cutter made the catch, then dove like a falcon onto the flailing demon host. He wrapped his legs around the Cogden, raised his rescued sword, and started hacking at the metal bastard while screaming at the top of his lungs. Sergeant Twitch stood there and watched Cutter fall towards his heroic death. Cutter! But Nubby, bless his blackened heart, sprinted as fast as his damaged leg could carry him back towards the bridge. About five seconds before Cutter and what was left of the demon host... Cutter, I was... I, Cutter's doing a Captain Titus. You're right, Warden. ...hit the ground. Nubby found the gravity control and threw it in the opposite direction. Sarge, <laughs> Doc, and Twitch all slammed into the ceiling... Nice. ...collecting a concussion, four broken ribs, nice. and a dislocated shoulder between them. Nice. Meanwhile, a rather bewildered Cutter flew back up the shaft on a very injured demon host... It took Nobby a few tries to get the grab. All right, where's the death court trooper? Your train's coming, bud. Your train is coming right now. Your train's coming. Hold on. Train's here for you, cut. Train's here for you, bud. Gravity just right, but eventually he zeroed it out, and Cutter managed to flail his way to safety. <laughs> As soon as he was clear, Nubby cranked up the gravity as high as it would go, and the Cogton flew down the shaft at incredible speed. Yay! Later, we checked the bottom of the elevator shaft. He punched through four decks and half of an awkwardly placed wall before he stopped. <laughs> we set up camp in the bridge. Doc had a nasty burn, but it would be okay. Good. There were a lot of minor broken bones, and Cutter had an impressive series of cuts all over his chest. The Cogton hadn't gone down easy. We were all still alive, though, and based on what Jim and Bill told us, the ship was in relatively stable condition. As relatively. long as you ignored the massive warp taint in the bow, yes. and the upper and lower decks, that yes. is. We called that a victory and stood the hell down. It took them half a day to rig up a replacement elevator, but we didn't notice. We were busy sleeping. Okay, so the reason that the train uh, sounds off the horn right there is because there is a road that directly crosses over the train tracks, maybe about uh, 150 feet in that direction. Getting the ship back in, well, ship shape, was a lot of work. Oh, wow, that was But horrible. easier than it might have been. For instance, we might have lost the navigator and astropath who steered our ship in the warp and enabled interstellar communications, respectively. We found the navigator alive and well. He'd apparently been following the standard navigator operating procedure for a warp incursion. Said procedure was just to lock yourself in your sanctum and ignore all the demonic silliness while you concentrate on steering the ship through the warp. Good navigator. A remarkably sane response, all things considered. Yes. And about the same as the one the astropath had been following. Except in the astropath's case, he wasn't keeping the ship from crashing into a reality reef. He was just hiding under his bed and crying. <laughs> we left the navigator to his business and pulled the astropath out 
then made him send a report along to Oak. Telling your boss that you're going to be late for work because 99% of your Mechanicus contingent had been possessed by demons and subsequently purged is very awkward. Yes, I so have no doubt it to be. mitigate the unpleasantness of the situation by blaming everything on the Cockton. It's not like the guy was in any condition to argue. Why didn't you blame everything on Nubby? I would have believed that. That worked to a certain degree, but we still wound up being very thankful for the slow and unreliable nature of astropathic communication. It saved us explaining the situation in detail, as well as the scathing lecture Oak would doubtlessly have given us in return. Anyway... Those two psychers were the only irreplaceable components on the ship. Old Bill loudly claimed that, given enough time and duct tape, he could fix everything else. Jim and Hannah were dubious at first, but the next few weeks proved the elderly engineer right. The next few weeks were very educational, also infuriating, exhausting, and occasionally scary, <laughs> but mostly educational. First, we learned how pragmatic engineers deal with sections of ship that have been warp-tainted, or only get sporadic Gellerfield coverage. You ignore them. <laughs> well, not exactly ignore. You still have to go through the effort to wall off the area and make sure nothing is living in there. Old Bill claimed that as long as there was nothing to possess, and no way for warp entities to get into the rest of the ship, it worked fine. Okay. At least until you could come in later and cut out the whole tainted section. All of us were a little dubious, but old Bill said he'd done the procedure several times before. In fact, all of those incidents where the front fell off had been the application of this method of damage control on a large scale. He even suggested wow. that if the shipyard was squeamish about the cost of doing a cut and refit, he knew a handy trick involving carefully lowering the void shields near a star. We pondered the melted look of the occurrence border's prow, and decided the man probably wasn't bullshitting us. No, he isn't bullshitting you. After that, we learned just how many crutoid creatures had been living in the hydroponics bay with that narlock. Apparently, the... The previous captain had decided that having a crew mercenary aboard would make him seem more like a rogue traitor. Of course, when the Xenos had the gall to demand payment, it had been ditched on a planet. <laughs> the crew's pets were harder to clear out, though. And the bay had eventually been sealed in hopes that they'd eventually starve. Uh -huh. They hadn't. In fact, they'd multiplied. And after we'd opened the bay, they'd flooded into every corner of the ship. The job of hunting every beaked beastie out of a section before it was sealed fell to us and some of the tribals. That sucks. It was rather disconcerting how many had started to mutate by the time we'd found them. No. Finally, we learned that despite its size, it only really took about 50 crewmen to fly the occurrence border if you didn't have to worry about cargo hauling or complex life support systems, that is. Oh, that's true. We managed to scrape up enough hands, but it was a close thing, and all of us were kept incredibly busy. <laughs> At least we weren't stuck with caring for those psyker kids, though. That job fell to some of the tribal women and the useless astropath. Thank you, Slacker. Slacker says, my man Bill. Bill has been extremely useful. Bill should just be left alone. Doc checked in on them occasionally and said they were doing fine. The rest of us took his word for it and stayed as far away as possible. When the repairs were finished, our journey to the shipyard resumed. Out of necessity, we kept the warp jumps short and the navigator stuck to only the stablest and best mapped warp currents, as go. opposed to the fastest ones. It took a good deal longer than we had originally been scheduled to get to our destination, but we did get there in the end. Once the occurrence border was finally in its dock, a shuttle came and took us to the shipyard. 
Well, it was an incredible relief to get off that death trap and onto a nice, solid station. The whole thing was rather ruined by the fact that one of Oak's personal retinue was waiting for us there. Hooray! The report didn't go over as badly as we feared. Oak's assistant was more incredulous than furious. <laughs> Every part of our story, from the ship's purchase to the Cogton's possession, was met with a sort of baffled exasperation from the man. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until we brought him to the ship and showed him the ungodly mess at the bottom of the elevator that he started believing us. <laughs> Despite our earlier promise to pin everything on Nubby, we did our best to put a positive spin on his part in things. No. Of course, in this case, positive spin meant twisting the truth into decorative little knots to paint his behavior as mere incompetence. No, a positive spin would be make him do a 360 on his way out the airlock. You know, as opposed to a deliberate subversion of inquisitorial justice in an attempt to score a cheap ship and look good for his boss. Oh my god. In the end, Nubby was fired from his job in supply. Thank which god. Which was good. And reassigned back to active duty as part of the squad, which was also good. So all that worked out pretty well. Once we'd convinced Oak's assistant that everything wasn't our fault, we were able to spare some concern for our fellow survivors. Okay. Luckily, the man didn't turn out to be the sort of inquisitorial agent who liked ordering mass executions after every little incident. Mm-hmm. Jim and Hannah were given a lot of praise for fixing so many things and not going all crazy like every other damn tech priest on the ship. Oak's assistant talked to some senior tech priests at the shipyard, and the Acolytes were given some papers which said they'd officially finished their apprenticeship and were being seconded to the Inquisition for their first independent assignments. Yeah, right. We welcomed them to the team and wished them luck with their first interrogator. All of us had been pretty sure the tech Acolytes would come out fine, but we'd been a bit more worried about what... They're going to be placed on the same ship with the guardsmen, and they're going to cry. What happened to old Bill, his band of unretired crewmen, and the hydroponics tribe? We needn't have, though. They were all just accepted as part of the ship. Both Oak's assistants and the yard's tech priests said that most ships had permanent inhabitants. They as really do. As they didn't get in the way, they'd just become part of the next crew. They really do. In our opinion, it was rather cruel to leave them on that horrible ship after all they'd done, but old Bill and the rest seemed happy with the result. We didn't kick up a fuss and wish them all luck. Finally, the half-dozen psychic kids we'd rescued were bundled off to whatever place the Inquisition sends powerful young psychers. Yes, the black ships. They're going to go see the Emperor. Oak's assistant seemed to think Ugh. that they were the one bright spot in all this mess, and said that their acquisition would do a lot to smooth things over with the boss. Mm-hmm. We took that as a sign that the creepy little buggers weren't just going to get shot, and didn't speculate whether being raised by the Inquisition was any better. <laughs> as for the occurrence border itself, the folks working on it said it was definitely repairable, Sure, it was going to take a year of intensive work to get it livable again. Yes. But it would fulfill its intended purpose as a disguised Inquisition transport wonderfully. Honestly, we didn't give a damn what happened to the horrible death trap. As long as we never had to set foot on it ever again, we'd call anything a victory. I'm placing a bet now. Once all the loose ends were tied up, we were packed onto a ship with Oak's assistant and rode back in relative peace. No one told us to do things, no one interrupted our sleep, Nice. and the only tech priests around were Jim and Hannah. Nice! It was quite relaxing, and we were in good spirits when we reached Oak's ship. Yay. Nubby was called down to his end of the ship for official firing before he was sent back to us. <laughs> Twitch and Cutter hauled the acolytes down to our regiment's section of the ship and showed them off like proud parents. Doc wandered off to a certain medical section of the ship and mm -hmm. wasn't seen for several days. Mm -hmm. When he finally got back, the poor boy looked utterly exhausted. Poor but he man. seemed happy. 
Sarge was called down to Oak's office. Not the whole squad, just him. Everyone speculated about what was going on in there. Maybe Oak was really pissed at us this time. Maybe he was going to force Sarge to accept a promotion. In the end, our fearless leader marched back out with a glazed expression and went straight to the bar. A few drinks later, we got him talking. Oak wasn't mad at us, and while he had hinted at the promotion, he hadn't carried through. Okay. The reason Sarge was called up and the reason why he was drinking was because he'd already received the squad's next assignment. Okay. In a few months' time, a whole new batch of trainees would arrive. Okay. It was our job to teach them. Whether they were guardsmen, psychers, or scribes, how to be proper inquisitorial agents. That was a damn tall order, and no mistake. Hell, we didn't even know how to be proper inquisitorial agents ourselves. <laughs> All of us sat down with Sarge and started drinking too. Yeah, good idea. This next one was gonna be weird. The squad. Okay. So. That. That. That was. A hellhole of a ship. By any metric, it was a hellhole of a ship. It was horrible. Um, how many boss fights? How many boss fights were in that singular one? Like that was insane at the amount of boss fights in that. Um, thank you, Slacker. Slacker says the next episode is the best. So, next we have, I think it's a three-parter, and I think it's two and a half hours long. I'm definitely not going to be able to do it until I have my next uh, day where I can actually sit down and don't have to go into work at night. So, keep your eye open for that. I'll probably split it up into two parts, just like I did this one. Well, not this one. I'll probably just split it into two parts. We'll see what we can do about it and uh, see if we can't, you know, get that done. Um this won't be the last time we see the occurrence border. The event horizon will be seen yet again when it resurfaces and then we get to have Sam R Sam Rhymes on it. The ship is the boss, <laughs> pretty much. Like the whole Tyranid uh, equation arc, yeah. Um, <laughs> Hobbit... Hobbit says, and now we have Event Horizon 2, Electric Boogaloo. Thanks, Hobbit. Yes, Ronnie, my sleep addiction is horrible. I know this. It's a nightmare. It sucks. It is what it is. Um, okay, so I had thought that giving myself two hours and 45 minutes would be more than enough time to watch everything, but I had to keep on stopping this. For various reasons that usually involve some numb nut shit that Nubby had done. In fact, most of it was because of numb nut shit that Nubby had done. Uh, Aquila says, Nomcom? Uh, yeah, on those ships you only have to deal with common incompetence. Uh, Deconius listed them off. Pissed off Narlocks. Pissed off Demon. Pissed off Servitor type. Pissed off Demon Narlock. And finally, pissed off, pissed off Demon Narlog Servitor Titan. Yes. Oh, Adrian says, have you considered not sleeping to make your day 32 hours long? No. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, let's see. Okay, so. Oh, man. Nubby needs to be fired out of a cannon into the sun. Just put him on a catapult. Seriously. Nubby, good. The The only thing he could have done to make that situation worse was to have that one bitch of an interrogator that he's in love with there on that ship, transferred onto that ship, and have bought her. That's the only thing he could have done to have made this worse. Because believe me, it was getting bad there for a while. It was... It, we were approaching bottom fast. In any case... Um, I'm going to be ending the stream in a couple of minutes. 
And then we're going to be bouncing over to a fan with too much time's new episode of Star Wars vs. 40K. Now, I had hoped that two hours and 45 minutes would be enough to get through all this, and I was wrong because it's been two hours and 45 minutes. Uh, need I remind you that Nubby saved Cutter? Yes, Nubby did save Cutter. That's the only reason I'm not saying to literally throw him out of an airlock while in a warp transit. Um, Commissar, a bloody magpie said, Commissar, this much work alert is not healthy. Take some time for yourself. I actually will be. Um, I'm going to be... I'm working right now on something that is going to be coming out when I, you'll, you'll see. But once I get done with that, I'm going to be taking some serious time and just, you know, just cutting down and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm going to be doing like one video a day instead of what I'm doing. Sometimes I can only do one video a day as far as a reaction goes. And the rest of that time I'm working on something else. I want to get the scripts that I have, um finish before I start up anything else. Okay, so next uh, All Guardsmen Party stream will be at some point um, either Saturday, well, it will be Saturday. I just had to figure out when my off day is going to be because that's on Saturday I will be watching something All Guardsmen Party. Alright, so I have to go ahead and shut this stream down, go into the other stream, tell them I need 15 minutes to get up and walk around for a minute and then I'll be back with you guys if you want to jump over to that stream I'm gonna be starting it soon and it's going to be for a fan with too much times Star Wars versus 40k thank you everyone for coming here I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did and I will see you guys soon if you want to stick around for all uh, for the um if you want to stick around and catch the next stream for um a fan with too much time, I'm going to be starting that off directly at 1 o'clock. If you got to go to sleep, I understand because I'm going to be having to go to sleep relatively soon after I finish the next stream I'm doing. But I did say I was going to try. I'll catch you guys next time or in 10 minutes. Thank you all for coming by. This was fun.